All right, guys, welcome back to the Dice Bearers podcast. I am Alexa, and with me here is once again Chris. Hello, hello. We are back. It that has been time. a while. <laughs> That's all right. Look, you know, it is what it is. Dwarves move slow, we move slow, so it's on, on you know, on theme for today's episode. Yeah, this one, this theme, one took right? three months, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I hate moving five in Reconnoiter, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Reconnoiter is a terrible mission. I think yeah. every one of these models would agree. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. And yeah, we are talking about uh, Erebor Reclaimed, both versions of the list, with uh, Thorn Oakenshield and Old Man Dane, as well as... Not so old man, Dane, in the Iron Hills, all in one. Just dwarf extravaganza. Figured exactly. may as well just get it all out in one go, right? Well, it's all following the same troop type, so we may as well do them on the one episode, right? So, exactly. yeah. Let's dive straight into it. So, what do you think of the models for this army, Chris? I think that the model range is absolutely wonderful. Um, I mean, it's a Forge World army, it's Lord of the Rings' first full Forge World release, and the models were absolutely stunning to boot as well. Um, now in the bottom picture you can see some of the dwarves that I converted up out of some of the Army of Thor style dwarves uh, but I mean to be honest if you're converting the dwarves or if you're buying them from Forge World you're gonna get a beautiful model range regardless what are your thoughts? yeah they're great models I like them a lot I like the goats I like the captains I like the flags yes the flags especially like I love how well decaled they are and how easy to just like paint them in yeah yeah it yeah. feels like a borderline coloring in on them it, but it just works <laughs> good models are just coloring books really right Literally, a good model right? will paint yeah. itself in some <laughs> senses so i think that this this army definitely has that going for it because it's all brand new stuff yeah and all the new stuff that's come out for them especially those new characters are absolutely gorgeous as well so i think if this is a model range that you even slightly like the look of when you look at the photos you will fall in love with them once you actually hold them for yourself and have a close look I mean, all your spears will bend. That's true. <laughs> That's why I did the steel rod trick on mine. They're, but... not, they're not that bad, honestly. They're not as bad as my Lake Town, so I'll give them, I'll give them that. Yes, Forge World be... resin is still resin, but it's not nearly as bad as... They're also chunky. It helps that the dwarves are really chunky, so yeah. they don't suffer from a lot of Forge World resin bends. Yes. They have a few too many C's in their chunk. But... Exactly, yeah. exactly. So they're, they're doing pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> so let's get into a quick overview of the list. So what are our strengths, Chris? Uh, well, you have a very powerful baseline warrior. Uh, these guys have, as we'll see very soon, high strength and high defense. Although they are a little bit on the expensive side, they do hold that line and kill and not die and do everything you'll ever want, as well as having a huge range of heroes to support them. These guys feel like the Mordor thing, where they just have so many named heroes with their own little gimmick each, except for a couple that don't really have a gimmick that does anything relevant but they they all have a thing that they do right and like I love the fact that you can just go I want a damage dealer let's plug this hill in I want a tank let's plug this hill in I want someone that's gonna restore resources onto my team here's this hero I want three heroics here's that hero you can kind of plug and play however you want and so I think because of how diverse their hero range is it doesn't make the lack of troop choices feel that bad yeah, it's not, it's not too bad. Yeah, you have a lot of different options. Some of them have a little bit of overlap, but it's kind of like you can pick your cheap option, your expensive option, and your bougie option. <laughs> you've got like three, right? three, you got three yeah. tiers of every, like, you want a combat hero, you can have like, uh, you know, Bofa, you can have like Dw uh, Gloin or Dwala, you know? Yeah, you, can, like, you can step up each time. Exactly, right? yeah. you can choose how many points you want to spend on guy who kills things. So yes. you do have that versatility, but everything is expensive, except your heroes, funnily enough. You can get you have a lot of cheap heroes, but you don't have any cheap troops. You're like yeah. looking baseline ten to eleven points, and you only mm. move five. Yes, <laughs> and I think to add on top of that, the cheapest point of march in your list is eighty points base, which hurts a lot. Yeah, none okay. of your named heroes have march, hey? No, except Dane, but he's one hundred and sixty yeah. points. So exactly, it yeah. is what it is. Yeah, so I think it's really rough not having that really high baseline of march. Um, or there is that really high baseline to bring March into your list. And I think the problem becomes, do you want to bring a cheap hero that can do a lot of tricks, or do you want to bring the March hero? And I think a lot of the time, people get tricked into bringing the cheap hero with tricks instead of the marching hero. When you move five, you need to move more than five sometimes. Exactly. Especially in that one or two games where it'll really matter. Like, if you get stuck playing something like uh, a sprinter across the board or getting to the middle of the objective style mi mission, you will get an absolute nightmare game if you were stuck landlocked at moving five <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly so it's a bit rough but you know it is what it is yeah you can, like, you can make it do that's you pay for it you, exactly. you get cheaper troops because they're only move five exactly and i think 
the value of one single march... I mean, just look at Seize the Prize, right? Mm. Like, one march means that you can access the middle of the board in the second turn instead of the third turn. Yeah. That itself is a game changer for a Dwarven faction. And so I think... You just have to bring March somewhere in your list. It's unfortunate, but you just do. And you wrote a list for this that doesn't have March in it. I did, yes. But I was going to talk about the shortcomings of it later. But... <laughs> uh, no, that's, that's fine. That's fine. We'll <laughs> get into like, it later. Like short, because... Like, because you move five? Yeah, because... Yeah, and... Um, I remember you telling me it wasn't a downside. What? No, there's no such thing as a downside with dwarves. It's only upsides. Because we like, always look up. Sounds right? like you're coping. <laughs> yeah, coping. <laughs> I'm hard on the coping right now, man. All right, let's get into our army bonus. So, will you follow me one last time? All friendly Erebor dwarf models from this army list gain the Dubikar special rule. Now, what the Dubikar special rule is, is if you're within six inches of Thorin Oakenshield or Old King Dane, if you play Old King Dane, yep. you get a banner effect. Yes. Is that good, Chris? I think it's phenomenal to just have the fact you just read and we have an army bonus that gives you re-rolls across some or potentially all of your models, depending which variant of the list you play. Yeah. So, so the way you think about it, if you're playing Erebor Reclaimed without Old King Dane, your Iron Hills dwarves that you can bring won't have access to this banner. It'll only be the heroes from the Erebor Reclaimed list. Yeah, because they don't have the Erebor, Erebor keyword. keyword. Yeah. They have the Iron Hills keyword because they're Iron Hills dwarves. <clears throat> which is a bit frustrating, but that's okay. There are a few neat things about this as well. It means Bo- uh, Thorin is a banner for himself. Yes. Which is fun, because he is an Erebor dwarf. Yep. And he's been six inches of himself. Sometimes, yep. Well, well, yeah, <laughs> in, most likely, you know. It'd be very strange if he wasn't. Yep. Um, so it makes him a really good ally. Mm. Yes. As I was alluding yeah. to the future there. But then, if you look at the old King Dane version of the list, you uh, end up swapping out your Iron Hills keyword for Erebor keyword across your entire list. So all of your dwarves, as long as you're a green ally, will gain the banner effect off of your king, which is a very big perk. Yeah, six inch banner, good. Yeah, very good. It's like, like having an army of Thor army bonus. Yeah, li- it literally it is, is the army of Thor army bonus, just with more expensive and higher strength troops across the line. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> that might be good. It could be. Could not be. We'll see. Right? <laughs> All right. Shall we get into the heroes, Chris? Yeah. All right. Let's start off with King Thorin Oakenshield. So for 115 points, you get a dwarf of Erebor who is an infantry hero and he is a hero of legend. He has a movement of five, a fight of six, strength of four, defense of eight, three attacks, three wounds, and courage six with three might, three will, and one fate. He comes with dwarf armor and a sword and a wide variety of actions with Resolve, Strike, Strength, and Challenge. Now, his options, pretty fun. You can get Orcist, which is a a hand-and-a-half elven-made weapon with a bunch of banes, which means it does D3 wounds to a few different types of heroes. And you can also bring a Wargoat, so he's 135 points. Um, And then his special rules, a score to settle. Thorin Oaken Shield, King Under the Mountain rules, all failed wound rolls when making strikes against Azog. That's pretty niche. It's pretty unfortunate when he's fighting Azog full stop. Yeah, you'll probably just lose. But you get something out of it at least. But on the upside, you do get the Ancestral Fury special rule. Throw an Oaken Shield may call a free hero combat every fight phase without expending might. That is pretty good. Yes. For How 115 good? points, it is absurd to just get free heroics built in. On three attacks as well. Exactly. Like... And obviously, you're going to get the GOAT for that 10 points. So it's 125 base to get this free hero combat machine popping off across the lines. At fight six, it's insane. Wait, Literally. Aemir is 115. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, when you compare this profile to a lot of that 115... Like, Shagrat, right? Shagrat's 115, 115 points. Even without the GOAT, if you compare them across, Shagrat is lower fight, but higher strength, to be fair. Lower defense, same attack, same uh, wounds, lower courage. And then has two more fate instead of the one fate. Like, it just... I'm sorry, but even Shagrat, as good as he is, is no... And Shagrat's one of the best, like, Forge Points heroes. Like, yes. he's best in class at 115. Yes. I genuinely think he's the best hero of Fortune model in the entire game, full stop, end of story. Fight me on it. But, like, even that, just compared to Thorne, is just so, so not relevant. And I love it. And the fact that Ocarist gives you that deep damage against... Orc, Orc, Goblin, Goblin and Uruk. Urukai, yeah. and causes terror when fighting those models as well. The real thing about it that's nice is that it gives you the option to uh, two hand. Yes. And it also gives you Elven Maid. Elven Maid, exactly. Like, yeah, and the words out of my mouth. Those things don't <laughs> seem like they're that massive, but being able to just two hand when you're calling free heroic combats is like a big up. Yes. Because it gives you 
plus one to wound on eight dice. Yes, and I know there's good. the downside of, oh, but if I roll a six, it's not a six. You like, can always spend a might. If it's you fine. commit one might point, you're essentially adding that one point might point across eight wound rolls. You're saying, I'm going to spend one point of might now, because I know I'm fighting two heroes and a berserker, mm-hmm. to now suddenly go, like, I'm winning the fight because I've rolled high on the striker, or whatever case that might be. Well, you're just high fight. Or because I'm just high fight and I combat it in. But now I also get to go doing D3 wounds at strength 4 with plus 1 to wound, effective strength 6. I'm going to be wounding most things on 4s. Worst case is a 5. And all because I went from 3 points of might to 2. Like, that is absurd to be able to say, I'm going to remove Lutz. And, and if you're fighting Azog, you get to reroll those as well. Exactly. Yeah, I get to one tap Azog just because I'm <laughs> like it, you actually do so much damage because that D three damage. Like you can oh genuinely God. call a combat off of two orc heroes reliably. Like that is absurd. And if you two hand, it's almost guaranteed. It's, it's very good. It's yeah. very strong. So he's really good, and he's a hero of legend, which means he's leading eighteen dwarves. Which I think something will will become a bit of a theme in this army is that. Uh, you need to be able to lead a lot of troops with your heroes because, yeah, you have a lot of heroes to pick from, but you really have to be smart with which heroes you plug and play with, I think. So Hero of Legend is a really good starting point. Yeah, all right, Chris, talk to us about Killy and Philly. Ah, yes, okay. So uh, we're going to talk about Philly and Killy in their overall profiles together because almost all of their stuff is identical. They'll have one different rule, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, But... Uh, Philly and Killy are Dwarf, Erebor, Infantry, Hero, Hero of Fortitudes for 75 points base. They're both movement 5 with a strength of 5, 3 plus shoot value, strength of 4, defense 8, 2 attacks, 2 wounds, courage 5, 3 might, 1 will, 1 fate, heavy dwarf armor and a sword for both of them as well. Uh, So some of their slight differences is Killy has accuracy and strike, whilst Philly has strike and strength. They can both bring war goats uh, as their mount upgrades, and they can both bring a dwarf bow as well. They have a couple of special rules. Uh, Swarm Protector for Thorn Oaken Shield, as well as a rule called Combat Synergy. So Combat Synergy, uh, basically, if you're in base contact with uh, each other, uh, like Philly or Kili are in base contact with each other, you can basically swap them around at the start of any phase, and it doesn't count as part of their movement. What that means is you can go in with Kili, do a strike up against another hero, expend all of your might points to try and flash kill him, and then even if you get countercharged, just, oh, I'm going to swap in and put Killy, who's on full stats now in, against the probably one might left, and maybe even no fate if you won that fight, and hope you can burn down the kill. It's not amazing, but it does help sometimes. And especially to go, like, if you call a move, I've seen this actually, you call a move with Philly, uh, who still has a goat, and then you do the swap with me rule, and you swap to the front of the move, so you can actually move and charge freely. You can do cute little things like that, but otherwise, it's it's a rule. It sometimes might be huge, most of the time probably won't. And the final rule that they both share is Dubakar, so that banner was within range of Thorn. What are your thoughts on these guys? They're fine. Combat synergy seems like theoretically, like I'm like in my head and I'm thinking like, because I didn't realize it was the start of any phase. I assumed it was like start of combat phase or turn. Yeah. But now I'm like imagining all the janky, stupid things I could do in theory and thinking, yeah. oh, that's so cool. And then I'm like, wait, I'm playing 75 points for strength forward to attacks. Well, I think that's the issue, right? And if you put them both on the GOAT, which you're probably going to do, you're paying, uh, was it 170 points for both of them together? To uh, 180, wouldn't it be? That'd be, uh, I, I'm like, I'm counting the bows. You bring yeah. the bows, surely. Three plus shoot, wolf bows. Ah, sure, why not? 180 points for that combo to occasionally be relevant. Now, they are goat heroes, which means they're going to be three attacks going to six and knock down with strike. That will make them playable no matter My, what. My, like, fun right? thoughts are like, you know, what if, like, start a combat phase, you know, you bait someone to charge your no might guy, and then you switch in your might guy, and then you, like, strike. Or what if you, like... Charge, so let's say you have both of them, and let's yeah. say Killy gets charged and Philly doesn't. Mm-hmm. And then Philly charges a guy who's next to Killy. Yes, and then exactly he's now charged, well. and now he switches places with Killy and he's charged, and then he's like knocking down a hero who charged the other yeah, guy, right? Exactly. Stuff like that. I'm like, oh, that's so cool. That's so cool. They can do these crazy things. And then I'm like, ah. Oh. But it's never going to happen. Well, even if it does, both <laughs> heroes have to be in base contact with each other, exactly. which means you have a huge power point in one spot of the game. 
which means you might just hard be losing somewhere else on the battle. And you're doing it all not... to put a, to a tax into a guy. Yeah, which like you could <laughs> the pay up for high. The payoff pay <laughs> isn't worth the amount of effort you're putting in. Yes. If this is like Dwalin and Floy or whatever, not Floy, um, Gloin. Gloin. Yeah. If, if you had this ability on them, they'd be like, "Oh, it's insane!" Yeah, because they're some of the best models on the game. Because they put out such crazy yeah. damage. Yeah, yeah. But these, these guys don't do anything. I mean, nah, they look cool, and one of them falls in love with an elf and dies. Yeah, well, that's the, that's the other special. Actually, they both die, isn't it? If, yeah. <laughs> if Killy dies, uh, Toriel gets uh, angry. Yeah, what was it like plus one? I think she loses one defense, gains one strength. Yeah, it's something... I think that's like the only other difference other than their their um. Yeah, specials. So you bring him with Thranduil's Hall on his own and suicide him in turn one every game, just so you can have like a fifteen attack Tauriel. No, she just gets plus one strength. Yeah, but she has the like she has the blade, uh, the knife. Yeah, yeah, in but, theory, yeah. it's like it's not that. Surely your opponent won't figure out that they're getting more attacks when they put more models in, right? <laughs> I didn't. Yeah, <laughs> I put like five corsairs in tutorial and oh, they all died dear. really fast. Yeah. And she calls a combat, right? Yeah, uh, I don't think she called a combat. I think she didn't have much might. Just mulch them either way, though. Yeah, yeah. She just chopped through them. All right, before we get too upset about this special rule, let's jump into our next hero. All right, next up we've got Balin. So, Balin is not a very fighty guy. He has 60 points. He's a Dwarf of Erebor. He's a Hero of Valor. So, leads 15. Yeah. Uh, big, big, big. Moves only 5 with a fight value of 4. A strength of 3. Defense of 8. 2 attacks, 2 wounds, and courage 6. He's got 1 might, 3 will, and 2 fate, bringing heavy Dwarf armor and a two-handed mace. Now, he's got 2 heroic actions, resolve, and defense. Okay, not bad. Yeah, it's he's a Swarm so Protector, and he's got Longbeard. In the priority phase, Balin may spend a point of will to enable his side to reroll the d6 in the priority roll. Interesting utility, not much combat ability. He's also stuck two-handing without a way to negate it, which is kind of rough. Correct. So when he's young Balin, or when he's old man of Moya Balin, he does have the choice of it. This is his weakest phase. Yes, this is his, yeah. <laughs> This is the worst Balin. <laughs> he goes from young, like, fit Balin to, like, midlife crisis Balin that he transcends into, into like, God badass Balin. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it's just the Master Forge weapon that gives him the... Uh, anyway. It, it is, it is. But he's only yeah. he goes to strength four and... That's it. Yeah. <laughs> gains nothing. Oh, he gains two might. He yeah. gets mightier. And two fight. Yeah, that's fair. It's a pretty big upgrade. Yeah. Two fight, two might, a strength. Like, you know. Yeah. Hits the gym. Who would have that's known it. that when you hit, like, 180, you suddenly you, you turn You get a off. second, yeah. second win. Second win. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but Balan, I think, is phenomenal in any uh, form, if you will, that you can bring him onto the table with. Mm. The ability to control the priority role is probably one of the most decisive things you could do in the entire game. And I've said it before, and I'll say it again, there is nothing more, like, feels good than just losing a priority role when you need to see what your opponent's doing, or you know that you have all the cards in your hand. Especially in a list like this that has access to crossbows and stuff like that, you can sit back and shoot, and as they're forced to close the gap into you, you can try to lose that priority role intentionally and react to where they're charging, or if they're still two turns out, are they going to step within five of you, or are they not? Like, stuff like that. You can really control a lot of the game just because of the fact that Balin can just spend a point of will and go, bippity boppity, I now have priority. Or, bippity boppity, show me what your entire turn's going to look like, mate. Like, it's fantastic. It is a powerful ability. I do think, though, it suffers in this just because everything else is so expensive. That's fair. Like, yes. in Army of Thrall, you have relatively cheap dwarf troops and you yeah. can also bring cheaper heroes and you also end up with more guys whereas here you have more big hero options than you do in like army of thrall yeah that are good you have more expensive troops you have 20 mm. point models in cav yeah um it's just harder to fit him i feel into like an arable reclaimed list as good as his effect is definitely i will say though in his defense he is the cheapest hero of valor in the game as far as i understand um, there might be some ruffian equivalent that might be something like that um, as well. But as far as I've seen, I think he is the cheapest hero of Valor in the game. P someone correct me if I don't. Probably. No, Denethor. L. Oh, Take yeah, 35 L. points. Yeah, you're right. Get out you're of right. Here. We were literally talking you're, about you're, this you're morning. You're actually an imposter. Yeah. But, like, either way, like, 60 points, that's absurd for a 15 model count. It is, it is. It's solid. Yeah. It's solid. I think he is a must-have in a list where you're trying to bulk out on troops. Potentially. But you could go... It, it depends on the breakpoints and how many points you're playing. That's also true, yes. And it depends what your big hit hitter is. If you're going a lot of points for like a Dane or something like that. Because I feel like most of the time, wouldn't you just end up with Thorin and two Fortitudes? 
Yeah, probably. Because you'd end up with Thorne, a captain, and whoever else you want. Basically, exactly, at that point. yeah. Yeah. But I think he could fill that role really if, well. If you need three more models but don't have like another hero spare, then yes, I could totally well, see it. I think sliding up 50 points, swap him for whatever hero you had, add three goats. Wow. Like, I, I dead set done that before when I played an 800 going to 850 game. So I just swapped <laughs> him out and went three goats in. And it worked really well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can see it. I can see it. All right, all right. Let's go to the opposite end of the spectrum. Tell me about Dwalin, Chris. Ah, yes. Uh, one of the weakest models in the game. Yeah. Dwalin the Dwarf is a dwarf arable infantry hero, hero of valor. He's 115 points, so starts at the exact same break point as uh, King Under the Mountain. Now, what does he get for the privilege of the same points value? He is a move 5, fight 6, 4+, plus, strength of 5. Okay, that's certainly pretty good. Strength of 8, 3 attacks. Fantastic. Only two wounds, that's a bit annoying, but oh well. And Courage of Six. He's 3 2 2 for his Might, Will, Fate, respectively. Uh, heavy Dwarf Armor, two handed axe, and two axes. He has Heroic Strike, and he has Heroic Strength as his war gear options, and can also bring a goat. So he can be 125 points in his profile, with the goat added in, and he has a couple of rules that are absolutely phenomenal. So the first rule is Burly, which means that two handed axe. If you piercing strike, he strike at strength eight. Free of charge, other than losing your defense if you lose that fight. So you don't lose. Exactly. He then has Fearless. Well, he has Swarm Protector as well, so I guess if Thorne dies, if you don't or you don't bring Thorne, then he's pretty good, especially as a hero of Valor, he'd make a great leader. He's only two wounds, but two fate means he's kind of okay. D8 also just means that like, it's two very hard wounds. Yeah, good luck actually. It's not like a, you know, Dalamir or something, which exactly. is D4. Yes. Now, I know what you're thinking. Ah, oh, but Chris, he only has a two-handed axe and two axes. He's going to get shattered off the table every single game. <laughs> well, thankfully, he has a rule called Weapon Master, where even if you find a way to turn Burly off and shatter all of his weapons, you also then have to contend with Weapon Master, which means that... Uh, you need Dwalin, Floy. <laughs> yeah, you need Floy and some Shatter Shamans, right? The ultimate combo. It's for, it's for doubles. Yeah. But he will never suffer the minus one penalty, uh, if he's unarmed for whatever reason. And uh, that will be the same when he's using a two-handed weapon. He has one more special rule, which is phenomenal. So, the King's Axeman is its name. Whilst he has the infantry keyword, uh, at the beginning of each fight, Balan can declare whether he's going to attack with his two axes or if he's going to fight with a two-handed weapon. If he fights with his two-handed weapon, he's three attacks, strength five, with Burley and all the rest of it. If he chooses to use uh, his other axes, he has four attacks instead of three. Now, you can only do this while he's on foot. You cannot do four attacks going to five on the go. Oh, if only. Which, if only. Uh, being said, stand. though, being it burly... Be so bonkers if you could roll Being dice. burly on the go, I think you're actually better off with that break point anyway. Uh, it depends on what you're hitting, but it also means you get an extra dice to win. Also, it means you can kill more targets in theory. Also means you can split your attacks better with double strikes. Yes, those are probably the benefits of it. But I think you're going to be wounding most things on threes anyway. Well, if it's D6, you're wounding on fours unless you pierce, in which case it's threes. But I'm pretty sure 10 dice on fours would be better than 8 dice on threes because of the way you split it. Because Possibly. Of the, because of the way double yeah. strikes works. Yeah, actually, because of the way double strikes work possible. You're hitting one entity. Because it means you, you're, you're less likely to waste an attack. Yeah. Or you, you, yeah. when you waste an attack, it's less, it doesn't feel less, as bad. less important. Because yeah. you might roll double strikes. also means you can carry yeah. combat against five guys instead of just four. Four, yes. <laughs> so, unfortunately, we can't do that anyway. But it does mean that he is absolutely phenomenal when he's on foot. Even if you don't bring him with the goat or if he gets dismounted from it, he's still very useful and it's toolboxy. And I love that. What are your thoughts on Dwalin? He's fantastic. Um, like, the only problem with Dwalin is that Thorin exists. Because as great as his damage output is, free heroic combats are just too hard to pass up in what yeah. they do in the game. Exactly. That's it. And also, he's not your banner. So, you know... And obviously, Thorin's not a banner for everyone, but Thorin being able to self-banner himself and bannering your other heroes is just, like, nice. Exactly that, yeah. And it just kind of, like, pushes it. And also, two wounds, two fate is worse than three wounds, one fate, and they have the same defense value... Yeah, but he does output a lot more damage. He is significantly better at killing stuff than Thorin is. Yes. I think over the course of the game, his kill count likely will get pretty close to the same as Thorin, even with combat side yeah. to it. Yeah, exactly, because yeah. Thorin can only... Re well, the fact is, because you can't reliably get into more than two targets, and both of them will reliably kill two targets of infantry... A turn, yeah. 
But Dwalin is way better at like blowing up a character. Yes. Now Thorin does have the ability to two hand, but that comes with risk, whereas it doesn't for Dwalin. Yeah. So Dwalin will always just two hand and not fear anything, whereas Thorin might choose not to two hand because you're like, I only got one might left, I need to save it, you know, all this kind of stuff. Yes. So th- those are the trade offs. I think generally Thorin will come out ahead just because Dwalin will often overkill whatever he's hitting. Whereas Thorin will kill it just right and then get a free combat and then hit something else. And then else. hopefully and then, again. And right? then kill one yeah. or two other models again. Yes. And if you're ever worried mm. about the Thorin, you can commit to the one model, then multi-charge on the hero combat. Exactly, yeah. That way you're getting three a turn, whilst Dwalin probably only gets two. You're just much more, either way. You're just it. a lot more flexible as Thorin. Yeah. And you're just overkilling a lot. Like, yes. Dwalin is... He's too strong. <laughs> he's spent too many points on being strong. Yes. And and as a result, he suffers. Yeah. But, I mean, on the bright side, when you're playing that doubles game against Floyd and Shadow Shamans... You're immune. Yeah. But Thorin would be useless. Yeah. Yeah. Locus would die and he'd just yeah. be out of the game. <laughs> and he couldn't even call combat. Yeah, exactly, game. right? Yeah. <laughs> but I think, yeah. Uh, the only other thing I'll say about Dwalin is I think that he is a model that a lot of people will look at in the same way people look at like an Azog or a Bog. They look at him and go, I need to either shut him out of the game or I need to just Halo effect him. Mm. And I think as a move five character, not a move six, that actually becomes like moderately scary instead of just, if my opponent is really talented at the game, it might happen. With move five, it's actually pretty easy to Halo effect out characters from being relevant off combats and things like that. And so... That's probably the only thing I'll say to, uh, about him that I dislike is how obvious of a target he is because everyone who plays the game for more than half a year probably has seen this profile and has shat the bed thinking about playing against it. Yeah, it's just, he, he is scary. He, yes. he is terrifying. But let's talk about Biffa, another terrifying dwarf. Yes, tell and me. For a different reason. What does Mr. Biffa do? All right, so Biffa, the champion of Erebor, is 65 points. He is a dwarf of Erebor and he is a hero of fortitude. He has a move of 5, a fight of 4, a strength of 4, defense of 8 with 2 attacks, 2 wounds, at courage 5, with 2 might, 1 will, and 1 fate. He has heavy dwarf armor and a hand and a half axe, so he can 2 hand or 1 hand, no burly for him. He can strike, he also has swarm protector, and he can throw stones! Ooh. Wow, that's exciting! Yeah. Okay, 65 points, alright, that's like, you know, whatever. Oh, also, he has an embedded axe blade. So if Biffa, the champion of Erebor, wins a fight, he may choose to headbutt his enemy with the axe blade embedded in his skull, instead of striking normally. He may make a single strike against his opponent. If Biffa manages to successfully wound his opponent, then the axe has been removed from his skull. Once the axe blade is removed, Biffa may call a free heroic move each turn without reducing his own might store. Interesting. Yes, this Is model... interesting good? <sighs> or is interesting too much effort? <laughs> There's so many things at play with this rule. Uh, I think the first thing we should address is how the Axe Blade interacts, because it's been commented on either way a few times now, uh, with the first question being, if I declare to Piercing Strike, does the Axe Blade gain the Piercing Strike benefit, as well as does it get the hand and a half going to two-handed benefit if I declare that as well? Pretty sure it doesn't, right? As far as I understand, it is one singular strike at the user's strength. Unless I can find something that tells me otherwise, an axe I swear blade this has an FAQ up, yeah. but I can't remember what it is. An axe blade, as far <laughs> as I understand, is not an axe, thus cannot piercing strike. Because that's a hyphened name, it is a different weapon choice and is not listed in the piercing strike weapons. From what I understand, if you choose to piercing strike or two hand and then use the axe blade later, cool. You're just making one strength for strike. The thing is, none of that matters because it's just too much effort. Well, I think if you get it off in a game, which isn't that unlikely, like if you trap someone out and trap them down for two attacks at strength four, it's a five to wound, if you're willing to commit one might point now to get three might every turn, it's huge, right? I can't remember if it's mightable. It it, It is. It's definitely mightable because it's a strike. I'm trying to remember this FAQ. Anyway, let's assume, let's assume best case scenario that you can like might it and all this. Yep. Let's say you can two hand piercing strike and might it up. Is it worth it? No. Why? Because you could just bring a better 65-point hero. But is free heroics over the course of a game worth? If it started as free heroics over the course of the game, sure. The fact that you have to put like resources into your... like You've got a hero who's supposed to do stuff, but mm-hmm. now you need to put resources and support him. Because he's just weaker than every other hero, because he's just fight four. Mm-hmm. Right? You need to actually support him so that he can get this kill, which he might not do. Mm-hmm. It's just not worth the extra steps over just taking a better hero in your list. Who will just do more consistently. 
Here's what I'm going to disagree on you. And I think it's fine. I is think Biffer in your list? He is the best fourth choice to bring into a list. If you're bringing four heroes, whether you want to go elite and low model count or because you have the points to spare, he's probably one of the best fourth choices in the game. Or in this list, anyway. Dwalin. No, no, Dwalin. Balin. Balin, maybe as well. I think him and Balin are both up there as probably some of your best Tekkens. I think Balin's a really good swap-out hero, and I think he's just a straight addition hero. Let me think. So, Thorin, I think, is probably the best. Yep. I would probably say Captain is your second. Yeah. Because you need March. I think that's automatic. And then I would put Gloin and Dwalin in tied third based on your points and break points. Yeah. Let's say we go with Gloin, the slightly cheaper option. Well, I'd say that they're, they're third, four, they're, they're tied third, mm-hmm. Gloin and Dwalin, based on how many points you have. Yeah. So, like, if you finish your list and you have your, all your models in your list and you have 20 points spare, you just make Gloin and Dwalin. Into Dwalin, exactly. Gwain. Yeah. But if, you, if you're thinking you're going to add a fourth hero, <clears throat> I think either this guy or Balin would be great Tekkens. Bomber. <laughs> Yeah, so this guy or, uh, or uh, Balin, I think, would be great Tekkens, I think. I think Bomber, he's great. He has, a, he has a rule that's really helpful in a couple of situations. Honestly, yeah, sorry, Bomber is better in Lake Town than he is in this anyway. Yes. But anyway, um, yeah, I could probably see both of Biffa being, like, fourth, fifth. Yeah, I think he's definitely not a first choice hero, but if you're doing something funky like a Thorns Company, something like that as well. If you're playing Thorns Company, sure. But he's he's would, phenomenal in that. And even if you the, do Thorns Company as champions as well, which I've seen a couple of times, he's really good in stuff like that. If you're going hero heavy, Sure, if you're going phenomenal. hero hammer, that's, that's yeah. fine, because of the way the list plays. But yes. in like a standard list... Mm-hmm. Let's say you're bring out all the toys. A thousand points? I wouldn't bring I wouldn't bring Philly on Killy. You're yeah. right. Balin, I think, is tied with him. Yeah. Dwalin is the same slot as Gloin. Yeah. Um, uh, what does Ori do? Actually, I might, I might challenge you and put. If you're playing that high point count, maybe I'd actually make an argument for Ori, because yeah. once you're looking at fourth hero choice, mm. you're playing like eight hundred to a thousand points. Correct. Yeah. So I might actually say that Ori might be better in terms of generating value. I think to an extent it depends on which heroes you bring as well, though, because if you bring Dwalin and Thorn. Then you, you, have your, you have your killers, right? You don't necessarily need like a Noi or an Oi or a Glory. Well, or, or, or he's not a killer. Well, right? or, he, or, he, or he restores might. Okay. That's also true. Yeah. So, so the, the thought for me is then you're bringing Ori to support those two big guys. To equivalently do something. Yeah, in, okay. in, yeah. In, but, because, but because of the way it works, you, you're, you're putting the might on the valuable models yes. rather than just being forced to call moves. Because you don't Definitely. always need to call moves. Like moves yeah. aren't actually always that high value, whereas combats and strikes are always value because you're choosing to yeah, do them for definitely. a reason yep. so I'd maybe put Ori into that he's yeah. also 10 points cheaper yeah, fair and enough. is a yep. similar combat profile similar profile yeah that sort of stuff um, I think yeah there's, there's a debate either, either way for it I like the idea of him oh, but... I mean, oh, okay. Okay. We've, yeah. been, we've been sidetracked to talking about the seven <laughs> other yeah, heroes yeah. that are coming up so yeah. Biffa maybe your fourth choice maybe not depending on if you're playing high points yeah but I'm sure Riley is going to tell us we're idiots for all of these who? conversations Riley the guy who plays Lawrence's mm. company who's that Riley from uh, oh, you, you haven't played recently in an event that's why uh, Riley's he's a guy from, shout out to you Riley he plays in the Newcastle scene in the Central Coast scene really good player really funny guy and he plays Lawrence's company and almost memed uh the recent event with it as well <laughs> excellent all right let's talk about bofa all righty is this one me it is uh me. yes all righty Good so luck. uh bofa is a dwarf in fact it's shocking isn't it <laughs> yeah. he's an elbow infantry hero of fortitude dwarf for 65 points he's move five fight four four plus strength of four defense eight two attacks two wounds coach of five he is two one and one with his might will fate heavy dwarf armor and a hand and a half hammer well, at least you can knock people prone with it. I think he is literally the last dwarf you take. But he has a cool hat. Um, yeah, but he literally does nothing. I love the idea of, like, stacked in the nines with heavy armor, and then he just has the same shitty hat that he started the movies with. What that does he just... do, Chris? What's his special ability? Well, uh, his special ability is Swarm Protector, actually. Uh, uh, so, no one shield. So, so, <laughs> so when Bofa is targeted by a magical power or special rule, you may ignore it on a 2+. plus. Yes. Which... Might be powerful in but, certain matchups. But what if I just don't target him, Chris, and I just target Thorin instead? Well, I think that's a bit unfair. Why would you target Thorin, who's a fight six, free hero combat person with a transfix, instead of Bofa, who's fight four, with a hand and half hammer, who's going to knock you prone? 
Good point. All right. Yeah. Point taken. So yeah. two plus, you'll ignore it. Yeah. His resolve strength, uh, resolve strike as his two heroics. The resolve is actually really nice, but there's a couple of other Tekkens with resolve like Barwin that you'd probably pick over him anyway. His ability just does nothing. Well, I think that's the problem. I think if he was a combat hero and had that rule. Or here's what it should do. It should be an aura of like three inches, four plus negation or something. I would love if he was like a one for one hero and could spend one will point and all airborne dwarves within six inches and gain that rule for a turn. That'd probably be too strong. I'd make it like a four up or something. But either way, something like that. He should give it yes. out. Just having... Because what's his name? Uh, Lindia does that for elves. He gives a magical Mag- resistance. Yeah. It should be something like that because having just one guy have ignore spell is useless because then he just will never be targeted. Exactly. And he's unless not, he's unless, <laughs> unless he's the last one left. Unless unless he's like, you know, Elendil, because Elendil has that. And the reason it's useless is because Elendil is a 200-point monster. Yes, who eats the entire world. So yes. he has to be targeted. <laughs> yes. Whereas Bofor is two attack strength four and doing nothing. But he's fight four. So, so he's, he's the, like the lowest fight of any of your heroes. So he's be. tying with about 50% of the models in the game. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. So, <laughs> all right, let's... <laughs> Shall yeah, we he's move not on? very good. I'll give you that. Is, is he actually lost pick? Uh... Is there anyone you would pick, like, after him? No, there's people that pick after him, but that's because they don't have the same hat. Okay, so, so it's not it's on aesthetics, not rules. Yeah, that's the problem, okay, cool. right? Yeah. All right, let's talk about Bomba. So Bomba the Dwarf is 60 points. He's move 5, fight 4, strength 4, defense 7, 2 attacks, 3 wounds, and courage 5. He has 2 might, 1 will, 1 fate. He has heavy dwarf armor, a flail, and heroic defense. Swamp protector as well. He has Beefy. When Bomba makes strikes, he may choose to bash as if he were using a mace. Cool. Lumbering. When he makes jump or climb tests, he must reroll sixes, and he may not call her moves. Finally, he has Raising Spirits. Once per turn, at any point in his move phase, he may choose a friendly model in base contact with him and roll a d6 on a 4+. plus. The model will regain a point of will spent earlier in the battle. Alright, so, the thing with Bomba is he's really good in Lake Town. <laughs> And I think that's the thing. When you look at him with the perspective of what his allies can bring to the table, he turns up, right? Because you can regain mm. will points on someone who can give up might points. Yes. So there's some silly stuff. Basically, you bring Alfred, who spends a point of will to give a point of might. And then Bombo gives him his will back. Because it's just choose a friendly model. It doesn't have to be dwarf keyworded. Exactly. Yes. And that's about it. Like, other than that, Bomba is solid. He's cheap. Yeah. He's 60 points only for three wounds yeah. at D7, which is... Hardy, his yeah. heroic defense, which is nice and useful, and that's it. And he's a completely mid fighter. He's just as useless as you are forgetting the best special rule in the game, which is called a flail. He does have a flail, yeah. correct? So he can also flail. So instantly, he's top five. <laughs> he can have slot five. Yeah, he can. We, be didn't, slot we, didn't, five. we didn't get to slot five. Yeah, he can be slot so, five so every time. Bomber yeah. is really interesting when you combine him with allies. Basically, um, yes. other than that, he's completely fine. I think the only other model you'd consider chucking in alongside him is a hero-style model that utilises Will, like Balin. Him and Balin are a great one too. Him and Gandalf are a great one too. Him yeah, exactly. Are a great one yeah, you too. need to combo him. On his own, he's nothing. Yeah. The, the, the thing is, most of the rest of this list doesn't use Will for stuff. It's your allies that are best at using... Like, even Balin is fine. But you don't need, like, that much yeah. extra. Balin probably only does it four times over the course of a game, if it's a longer game. Yeah, exactly. He and has so enough will. One point of will is all you need. Is whatever, right? yeah. yeah. Whereas, like, Gandalf or Alfred will get a lot of value over it. Exactly, yes. Um, you can, so in think... theory, generate infinite might. Yeah. And I think those are probably the type of heroes you want to bring alongside these guys, if you're looking at mm-hmm. doing some of these smaller heroes like Bomba. Yeah. So. Next up. Take it away, Chris, with Ori. Yeah. Ori the Dwarf is a Dwarf Erebor Infantry Hero of Fortitude for only 55 points. So, so far, he's up there with some of the cheapest we've seen so far. He is the cheapest, I think. Uh, so far, yes, he is, actually. He is move 5, fight 4 with a 3-plus shoot value. Ooh, very cute. Uh, he has strength of 3, defense of 7, 2 attacks, 2 wound codes of 5. He is 1-3-1 one, one for his might, will, and fate. 3 will implies he's going to do something funky with it. He has heavy dwarf armor and a hand and a half axe, so can two hand if he wants to. Can piercing strike to be strength four, which is also nice. And he has hook defense. He's sworn protector as always, and he's a chronicler. So, at any time that Thorn Oaken Shield or a champion of Airborne model slays an enemy hero or monster model within three inches of Oi, that model immediately regains a might, will, or fate point. You get to choose which one of those that they had previously spent in the game. So, very complex way of saying, 
If Ori is nearby and an enemy hero or monster dies, Ori says, you get a might point, you get a will point, or you get a fate point, basically. Mm -hmm. Again, he's a great tech end piece, but when you're stuck at fight four and strength three for 55 points, I think he's probably up there with, like, your Bomber Star models. There has to be a very specific reason why he's being thrown into your list. Like I said, he's, he, he's like the same thing as Biffa, where you bring him as like a fourth, fifth choice if you want to generate some free might. Yeah, and I think you <clears throat> really will struggle with that might point sum uh, as well if you're fighting the wrong player. Like, I've played games where I've won a game without ever hurting or killing an enemy hero. Mm -hmm. And... I, I enjoy being able to play into my opponent's heroes like that and mute them and cut them off. And I think if you're playing that type of way or if your heroes that your opponent brings are either game-ending heroes like a Sauron then you're just not going to deal with them properly or it's a model that you probably, like, won't get a good chance to kill like rolling into a Gilglide and hoping you that they run out of might and that the roll-off goes your way. Like, those type of heroes will be frustrating for you to play. Conversely, if your opponent only brings one, maybe two heroes, this rule is going to happen maybe once in the game, and that's if he's still alive within three inches of the enemy hero. That being said, he is only 55 points. Yeah, but like putting him in next to Gilglad, right? Hoping that Gilglad dies. You just wouldn't. You'd instead just... of Gilglad just mulching him in a combat. Like, it's tricky to make him work, I think, is what I'm trying to say. Or you fight against orcs and just kill every captain, and it's just a might Yeah, farm. but then on the other side of it, like my Strike House Mordor list, where I have like seven or eight heroes at 750 points and they're all fight four fight five two uh like three one one characters like you're having the time of your life you're just gonna shove Thorin in there with your elven made yeah. game weapon you're gonna all right strike Call them one in. strike against five <laughs> enemy heroes because they dogpile you and kill them all right? exactly yeah. and then you just like and you're like oh i'm gonna spend two might to kill this guy now i get a might back yeah. i'm gonna spend this new might to kill this guy yeah. and then i get my might back <laughs> and then you just you just keep going down your line like that right exactly. and i think that's where mm. he can turn up but you have to know your opponent's list or get really lucky with matchups and things like an event, I think. I mean, you just have to, like... You, you just you can just not use his ability. You can just be like, he's 55 points for more guys. Yeah, but I'd rather pay 60 points to influence the priority role and bring three extra models. That's exactly it. Right? And I think... Yeah, so he's, like, he's like... Well, he's the same to me as Biffa, where he's, like, sometimes randomly useful. Sometimes trying to get Biffa's ability off will just get Biffa killed. Exactly. And I think Biffa is... Guy... Like, if there's a Gilgalad and Biffa runs in to try kill an elf, Biffa's, one, just gonna lose... Exactly. And then two just going to die. Yeah. So in the same matchups where Ori is bad, Biffa is also bad. Yes. And so I think this model is probably like a fifth or sixth choice character. Or really specific use character. I think if you're looking at something like turning Dwalin into your king of the world style killing the everything yeah, style yeah. model, he could be really big. Because it kind of lets him do free hero combat. Exactly, right? You can pseudo free hero with him. And, like, put this guy next to, like, a Gothmog or something like that, and then that let, uh, and let, let your let him model run, yeah. swing into the back of him. That's maybe the use for him, but again, I think he just gets outshined by other stuff in the list. Like... Nori! <laughs> Alright, so, Nori the Dwarf, champion of Erebor for 80 points. You get a Dwarf infantry hero of fortitude with a fight of 5, a strength of 4, defense 8, 3 attacks, 2 wounds, courage 5, and 2, 1, 1. He has heavy Dwarf armor, a mace, and a shield, so he can shield for 6 attacks. He has Heroic Strength and Heroic Strike, and he is a Weapon Master, so he is never considered unarmed and does not suffer the minus one penalty for 200 weapons. He also has Weapon Synergy. Nori the Dwarf may roll one dice to win a dual roll and one dice when making strikes. So oh. he can roll a lot of dice. They've made a mistake here. Weapon Synergy, that's meant to say Lord of the West, right? Um, well, yes, but no. Yeah. But yes, yeah. it's a very powerful rule. Yes. Like, <clears throat> what the heck? You have an 80-point Lord of the West in the, in the list. Yeah, yeah. Um, the only, like, downside to him is he's two wins, one fate, so he's a squishy boy. But, but he's a 5-5, five, five, three attack striker. Exactly. That alone makes him powerful. Mm. And the defense eight compensates for being the two wins, one fate a little bit. And, like, I, I genuinely think he's a very, very powerful tech end piece into a lot of different lists. He's one of those heroes we mentioned earlier, where he's your not bargain basement style model, but he's that middle style tier of can do a lot of different things. He's strength four, which means he'll kill most troops on fives. He can shield away bigger things, or if he's really heavily outdiced or outfought or whatever that is, he's probably going to roll a six on seven dice natively, eight if Thorns nearby when he's shielding. Like, I would really like if he had defense. That's my one thing. I don't think he needs it because he has that shield. 
He can shield, sure, but if something like higher fight runs into him and strikes, he's just in a bad spot. Yeah, but I think... It doesn't matter how many dice you roll when you're already behind on odds to be lower fight kind of deal. I think with these type of heroes, though, I'm happy to spend one of my might points to trade into one of a Lendu's might points for a strike off. Because I think usually big things that are going to eat him for breakfast don't have blood and glory or rules like that. Well, we're playing, we're playing Contest of Champions, so my London well, does have that's the, that's right. the problem then, right? <laughs> yeah. But if you're, playing, if you're playing Contest of Champions yeah, against you've a got bigger deal, problems. You've, you've probably got a couple of other issues going down, and Noah is probably genuinely a really good answer to try and slow down that model anyway, right? Like, Yeah, he's solid, he's solid. Yes. Um, Mike, yeah. It's just hard because there's other heroes... Well, we're going to get to Gloin in a bit, who I think kind of just is better. Look, I think <clears throat> the next two models that we're about to talk about in my opinion, are Noi, but slightly better, and for different reasons. Yes. But he is still, in my opinion, a really, really clever Tekken. I think... Purely because of the Lord of the West. If he cost, like, ten more points and had three wounds, then I'd, I'd love him. Yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah. Alrighty, let's talk about uh, probably one of my, if not favourite model in this little section of the heroes, uh, Doi the Dwarf, who is a champion of Erebor, being a dwarf Erebor infantry hero of Fortitude. For 75 points, so 5 points cheaper than our previous. And Doi has heavy dwarf armor and a two-handed mace. He is uh, also... I should go through the rest of the profile properly, shouldn't I? He's move 5, strength 5, 4 plus, strength 4, defense 8, 3 attacks, 2 wounds, courage 5, 2, 1, 1. Uh, like I said, heavy dwarf armor and a two-handed mace with strength and defense. So he's your defense hero. And he's got a couple of really good rules. So, one of them is the Weapon Master. He's never considered unarmed, never suffers a penalty for two-handed uh, weapons. So, he's burly, right? Three attacks, burly, strength four. Already great, right? Yep. He also has defense, which means you can plug him into something like an Elendil and not worry about a strike-off, which means you probably stay alive instead of randomly getting flash killed because I rolled a nine on my fight value and he rolled a ten. Mm-hmm. And he also has a good sort, really. If Bilbo Baggins is within three inches of Doi, uh, then he may spend Doi's might, will, or fate as if they were his own. Basically, if Bilbo gets stuck in a bit of trouble and Doi's nearby, Doi can say, you get a might point, here you go. Or if Bilbo's in a better position to call a move or something like that. You can use little cute things like that to help him out. It's similar to Boromir and the Hobbits, basically. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting little thing, though. I don't think it'll come up too often. It probably more comes up more in company anyway. Yes. I think this model, you look in isolation and say, this is a phenomenal three attacks, burly, cheap hero. I think when you compare uh, Nori to Dori, you see how much he's paying for Lord of the West. Yeah. Because they're the same... Like, the entire stat block is the same, except one of them has a 200 weapon and the other doesn't. Yeah. Basically, yes. And also, defense is better than strength. <laughs> yeah. I definitely I definitely agree with that. And so, I think... And he's Doi, also five points cheaper. Yeah. Doi, I think, plays a really fun role of being the either doorstop character of here I am to just stand in front of a land deal and die slowly over two turns, sometimes three if you get lucky. Or... He's that I'm going to go into two warriors with a spear behind me, roll my four dice, get a six, kill two models because I'm wounded them on fours. Rinse and repeat over the course of four turns and I don't give a shit if I get charged or I'm charging because I'll always do it. And if you only put one model into me, I'll call a combat. I don't care. And then I'll hit backline Smash. models. Yeah, exactly. I think he plays a really good dual role in that sort of list because he can do both really well, basically. I think he's solid. He's solid. Yeah, definitely. On to Oin the Dwarf. Well, 65 points, you get movement 5, fight value of 4, strength of 4, defense of 8, only 1 attack, mm. 2 wounds, courage 6, 1 might, one uh, 4 will, 1 fate. He has heavy dwarf armor, a sword, and a shield. He has heroic resolve, and now he has two special rules. Yes. Firstly, he has healing herbs. In the move phase, instead of moving, Oin the dwarf may attempt to heal a friendly model, which he is in base contact with. Roll a d6. On a 1 to 3, there is no effect. On a 4 or 5, the model regains a wound lost previously in the game. On a 6, the model regains all of its lost wounds. Interesting. Going off on a 4 plus is a bit... But not bad. Sometimes helpful, sometimes not, right? If if it was, like, more reliable, I'd like it more. If you spent will to do it or something. But he does spend will for something. Once per fight phase, only the dwarf can expend a will point to enable a friendly model within three to reroll a single dice when making a dual roll. So it lets you do like a double reroll with your banner as well. Yeah, basically. Which is neat. Um, the fact that he's only one attack is pretty, <laughs> pretty bonkers. 
Yeah, I think he's probably up there with the last ones you'd be picking, unless you're doing a Thorns Company in yeah. Champions. Or, or you're doing like, like a Dwalin kills the world. You bring Oin and um, Nori, and then just sit around Dwalin and just let him kind of <laughs> pop off. Yeah, but that's it's just not worth it. You'd just rather spend sixty five points on more dwarves or something. Well, I think that's it. Right? Like, would you rather have this guy stand in base contact with Dwalin and hope that Dwalin doesn't call his combat so you can heal him a turn? And it turns time. Well, if like, you lose, you back away into base contact with Noise. Yeah, but it's still not nice. Oh, it's not worth like, it. It's so not good. Yeah. It, it's just not. Well, then you're spending 65 points to maybe give an extra wound to someone. Exactly. And you're spending 65 points for one attack. That hurts. Well, he's not even going to be attacking because he wants to be healing people. Well, and that's it. I mean, you can let him get charged and then he'll still be able to heal. And he'll stuff. back away yeah. and heal. Yeah, it's just, it's just not worth it. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's just rough. I don't think he's the model you'd be picking most games. No, but a model you will be picking in many games, Chris, take oh away. Oh my gosh, yes. Gloin the Dwarf. So, he is a Dwarf Airborne Infantry Hero, Hero of Fortitude. Probably the best Hero of Fortitude we've seen so far on this list. He is 90 points for the privilege. Movement 5, Fight of 6. Here we go. Uh, 4 plus Shoot Fire, which no one cares about. Uh, he has a Strength of 4, Defense of 8, 3 Attacks, 2 Wounds, Courage of 6, 3 Might, 1 Wound, 1, oh, one wound, one Will, and 1 Fate. Heavy Dwarf Armor and a two-handed axe with strike and strength is his uh, two heroics. Swarm Protector, great. He also has a, uh, a Warrior Born special rule. He must reroll once to wound in combat. What an unfortunate roll, rule it is that you have to, no matter what, reroll. Sometimes I don't want to kill you. I'm trying not to break you, that's Chris. True. I don't want to reroll. That's true. No, that's true. Mom, that's true. I'm going to mite it to a two and then not reroll it. He also has a rule that we've not seen yet. It's called Weapon Master. It means that he's never considered unarmed and doesn't suffer the penalty for two handed weapons. So, he is a burly, strength four model. Uh, same as uh, Noi. No, Doi, that we saw earlier. But. He has an axe instead of a mace, so he can go to strength 5 when he's two-handing. And he's a base profile fight 6. That makes him absurd, in my well, opinion. Well, he's really, he's just mini Dwalin. Yes. So you're paying 25 points less. Yeah. You lose a point of strength, and you lose the double axes. Yeah. And you lose a point of fate. Yes. Everything else is the same. I think if you look at this model, if you're comfortable taking a foot version of like a striking killing hero, you bring this guy and two goats instead of bringing Dwalin on the goat. And that's roughly the same sort of points. It's uh, five points cheaper doing the Dwalin model. Yes. But if you look at it something like that, will you get more out of Gloin in one spot and two goats somewhere else rather than Dwalin on that goat the whole game? Well, Dwalin needs to hit characters, basically. Yeah. And I think sometimes you'll get more out of the Dwalin, sometimes you get more out of the Gloin. And that debate against one of the best heroes as we've already talked about means that this guy's a keeper, no matter what. You could even do just a foot Dwalin. But yeah. anyway, the point is though, they're both fantastic. And like I was saying, they are those, like some of, uh, some of the heroes in this list are like interchangeable based on points. And I think Gloin and Dwalin yeah. are in that slot where like, if I've got 30 points left over at end of list building, Gloin is going to become Dwalin. Exactly. Yes. And I think, yeah, of the champions, Gloin, if you're looking at the cheaper version of the list, he's almost always your first pick. I think just the fact that he's cheap and his fight six, he is just wonderful for what he does for a list. Um, now, there's one more hero we're going to talk about as part of the Champions of Elbow Elbow claimed version of this list, who also doubles as our leader of the Iron Hills. Dane Ironfoot. Yes. So, for 140 points, you get a dwarf Iron Hills, so no Erebor claimed keyword on him, who is a hero of legend with a move of 5, 8, fight of 6, <laughs> strength of 5, defense of 8, 3 attacks, 3 wounds, and courage 7. Not that it matters because he's fearless. Uh, a might of three, a will of three, and a fate of three. He has heavy dwarf am armor and a two-handed hammer with a cadre of heroic actions, <laughs> missing only accuracy, I think, with resolve, march, strike, strength, and challenge. Yes. For 20 points, he always brings the war boar, so he's 160 points. <laughs> the boar is move eight, fight four, five plus, strength four, D defense six, six, and two wounds. Two wounds. So it is the toughest mountain. Is, is uh, Thrandall's elk is only D5. Well, I mean, fell beast, so. But okay, like, sure. Yeah. Okay. That's not, but, that's not 50 points. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's um, probably the best uh, points effective mount you'll get. Basically. Thrandall gets plus one strength out of his. Yeah. So it's, it's a debate. Either way, insane. He's also burly and fearless. Yep. <laughs> Fantastic. Yep. <laughs> also, he has... Four special rules. Firstly, yes. Lord of the Iron Hills. When Dane Ironfoot, Lord of the Iron Hills is alive and on the battlefield, all Iron Hills dwarves within 12 of Dane automatically pass all courage tests. 
As soon as Dane Ironfoot kills an enemy model for the rest of the game, if Dane is in charge range, he must do so. So there's a downside. You do have to just keep charging after you get a kill. But so you could, in theory, get pulled somewhere weird. But it only turns on after you kill a model. Yes, you have to get one kill first. Which, which is... basically means when lines engage, he's going to stand the fight and not run for the objectives, which is fine. Right? You could get memed where someone feeds your Dane a kill somehow yes. if you're not paying attention, and then they just like pull Dane out of your army. So you got to yes. be careful. I've done that before where I was really, really lucky with how I maneuvered and just like I got him a kill early in the game because it was a Maelstrom game and his warband deployed on top of me and got like a bunch of kills because he killed like a half a warband, mm -hmm. right? And then I placed one singular wood elf uh, like 7.8 away because yep. I want to move off against him so he couldn't even put someone else in the way to stop him charging me. Oh no. And I just put that wood elf in range and then he sprinted forward, I double transfixed him, the second transfix works, and then my counter move swamped and killed him. It was fantastic. <laughs> Fierce of charge. In yes. a turn that <laughs> Andane and Iford, Lord of the Iron Hills, charges in combat, he causes terror until the end of the turn. Yes. Neat, useful. Headbutt. This is probably the best rule in the game. If Dane Ironfoot, Lord of the Iron Hills, wins a duel but fails to slay his opponent, select one man-sized or smaller model in the fight and roll a d6. On a 5+, plus, Dane will headbutt that model and it will be knocked to the ground. In other words, if you decide to kill someone's horse instead of going for the killing blows on them, you have a good chance to just knock them over at the end of the fight anyway. It's not, that, not that Dane will fail to kill anything, well, but and that's it is it. what it is. So Dane plays two roles. Firstly, he's the leader of your army if you're playing the Iron Hills, because he's your hero of legend. Yes, so we should mention, gains four plus master of battle if you're playing pure Iron Hills, and also plus one minus one on Iron uh, Maelstrom, or is it just choose? No, it's the plus one minus one for your entire army. Yes, yes, he gives yeah. it, yes. So... He, if you're playing in Iron Hills, gets the Master Battle. That's his specific rule. He also gains access to that plus one, minus one when coming onto the board for a Canoida or a Maelstrom mission. But importantly, he won't have that if you play Erebor Reclaimed. Exactly. And he is a hero of Valor in Erebor Reclaimed as well, which means... Thorin must be leader. Yeah, if you bring Thorin, that is. But you can bring him and Dwalin instead, Ooh. which I think is probably a low-key phenomenal low tech end, Ooh. right? And you have March then. Exactly. Ooh. And it means that he can months? still be your leader... 650, that'd be pretty baller. Yeah. It means he can be your leader, basically. Mm. And you can bring Dwalin, who is probably one of the most effective killers in the game, who can still bring a goat. Now, the goat is nowhere near as e uh, hard to kill as the boys, but he is still phenomenal. He also has the benefit of, like, your normal elbow, uh, your normal Iron Hills warriors don't get the banner effect, but even in Elbow Reclaimed, they get the Fearless Bubble because they're still... Iron Hills keyworded. Yeah, yeah. So they're still fearless near Dane. And because he's fearless and they're fearless, him and his captains can just spread huge bubbles of no one's going anywhere if you ever do break. It's phenomenal. Well, only, only your heroes will flee. Well, exactly. And, and their card is 6 7. And Swarm Protector well, to Thorn. If, if you're he's bringing Dane, you're probably yeah. not bringing Thorn. But anyway, Dane so, is fantastic. He yes. also just kills everything. I think he is probably sort of like Azog and Bolg, like the highest damage hero in the game. Elendil's up there. Yeah. Non he's tied with Elendil? Non monstrous monsters. He's probably one of the highest. Because he's strength five game. plus one. Yeah, he's tied with Elendil, Helm Hammer Hand. Yeah. He's literally the top bracket of non monster damage. Well, I think look at it as Helm's the fight five, he's the fight six, Elendil's the fight seven, all doing the exact same thing. Yeah, they all have the same damage. They're three attacks, strength five. Yeah, with a mount, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. So they're in the top, basically top damage bracket of heroes. Yeah, basically. And he is a character that I have seen take off almost every other type of thing in the game. He's one-tapped Gullivars. He's one-tapped Sauron's. He's one-tapped, you name it, he goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with it. Other than maybe like a Balrog or something absurd like that. He'll two-tap that. Yeah, two turns, right? Yeah. It's mathematically impossible to one-shot it. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, That'd be pretty, yeah, yeah. pretty crazy if you one-shot it. Yes, but the fact that he just is a hero that can just exist on the table and do everything you want and he's your only named character that has march correct so which is crazy he can replace your captains mm -hmm. in a lot of lists yeah i actually really like that dane dwellin list idea yeah that seems fun so i've played that list a couple of times at 650 and once at 700 700 felt a bit bad because i think i added a few too many goats to help compensate for my points because you didn't have enough space in warband you do but it just doesn't feel very nice to just bring 50 points worth of extra dwarves and it was either that or a second banner and so i ended up doing uh i took a couple of points off from spears and one more warrior and two more goats into the list it felt okay but is whatever yeah 650 exactly. seems more ideal for it anyway yeah. 700 you probably want to bring thorn and like but then if you go to 800 him uh gloin and, and then a third hero yeah exactly yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 
so I think like, that's when it turns up even more. Uh, you do lose your Masso battle rule, but if you bring him with Balan, you almost don't care. It feels quite similar. I mean, all you're trying to do is force Might off of your opponent. I'm going to roll the 4 up anyway, so it's not like I have Master of Battle. Yeah, that's true. You never roll that 4 plus, yeah. <laughs> yeah, anything else we think we need to add other than the fact that he's phenomenal and you should bring him a lot? <laughs> uh, no, that's pretty much it. Don't fight him. Yeah, if you have a chance not to fight him, please. Yeah, yeah just don't. All right, next up, Chris, tell us about Muren and Dra. Yes, so 140 points. So if you look at these guys as 70 points each, they are a wonderful little one-two. So... I'll go through Muen first, then I'll go through Dra first, then I'll talk about how they interact. So Muen is uh, move 5, fight 5, uh, 4 plus, a strength 4, d8, 2 attack, 2 wound, courage 5, 3, 1, 1, hero, with da, 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 dwarf armor, shield, and a named sword called Kazlagazgal. Yep, that's it. Na- Yep. Kalazel. Um, yeah, Kalel. There you go. How many, how many dwarf players can we have set in? 10 seconds uh, well there's only two of them so yeah so us <laughs> yeah exactly have dwarves, have dwarves, yeah. So. <laughs> uh, this is a sword I'm glad for the clarification uh, additionally Muon receives a plus one bonus when making strikes against orcs goblins and Urukai models he has heroic strike as his only action as well so when fighting evil armies he will probably have a plus one to wound bonus which is great right for 70 points Think of him as a 50% of the time, plus one to wound, two attack, hero, defense eight, that can shield. He's okay. 70 points, that's pretty good. That's about the average of what we're seeing out of some of our champions anyway, yeah. right? And you have Dra on the other side, who is move five, five, uh, fight five, four plus, strength of four, defense seven, so one pip weaker, uh, two attacks, two wounds, courage five, three, one, one as well. He is heavy armor and a dwarf bow, which means if you get him caught in combat, he is unarmed. But what? that is okay, because he has expert shot. So basically, you keep him in the background and never fight in combat with him. I never realized he's unarmed. Yeah. That's obscene. Yeah, I That's had to tell really... my opponent at Clash that they were unarmed, and they were not very happy with that answer. I wouldn't be either. I would, yeah. I would call up Jay Claire and ask, why doesn't he have a sword? Mm-hmm. Uh, because he very clearly has a dagger on his back. Anyway, um, surely it's in the FAQ. It's I, not. It's, I, know, I know it's yeah, not. No, but it's... <laughs> either way, I think Dra and Muon are a great little one too. So they're a package deal, which means they have to be in the same warband, and one of them takes up the slot of the first model in a warband. What that means is Dra is almost always your warband leader in case you need influence coming onto the board with might points, unless you're playing with them as your only leaders because otherwise Muon has to be the leader because he's the one that'll be killing in combat in case he plays something like Contest. Uh, right? You're not running on the, if they're, They should never be your only character. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, basically, Draw should be the leader of your warband. For 70 points, they're a great little one-two. Expert shot with a dwarf bow. It's strength three, eight in its range. Two shots on it means that you can kind of play a bit of that somewhat skirmishy stuff. And putting might points on bow shots is always going to be useful anyway. They're an interesting choice. I think... Going from a uh, breakpoint of like 650 to 700, teching in Muon and Draw instead of a captain just works really well, right? Because it's a 50 point upgrade, you get your extra might points out of it, you get some more tech in rules and that sort of stuff out of it. I think that can work really well, and I've done exactly that in one of the lists that we're going to show off a bit later. But what are your thoughts on them? I've never liked them, and now I like them even less. Now that you told me to use a melee weapon. I look, so like for me, it's always just been. I don't care that much about two captains on foot without March. Mm. Sure, they have plus one might. I don't value might that highly. I'd rather just have a captain on a goat and then 50 points more of whatever else I want in my list. Yeah. That's think- always been my, my thought process with them and, and even more now with the draw having just a bow. Yeah. I think when you look at these guys as two captains are 160 points base. Mm-hmm. Uh, so for 20 points more... They're both going to be that higher defense level um, as the captains, but with two less points of might, but have massive battle built into it. Well, I'd only ever bring one captain. Well, I mean, if you're looking at it as a points comparison. Sure, sure, but I would would compare it to one captain and, like, five dwarves. Yeah, something that's probably a better go at it, right? And so if you bring a mounted captain for 90 points and, let's say, four or five dwarves, is that going to do more than these guys over the course of a game? I think potentially, especially off the march. 
I think if there was no march in the question, or if really... these guys had march, if one, of, if if like draw had march, yeah, suddenly much better. I actually really like them. But the problem is, it's, it, it doesn't. It, it also varies better whether you're playing Iron Hills or Erebor Reclaimed. Yeah, Erebor Reclaimed, you have so many other interesting options. Well, these guys aren't in Erebor. I know, but I, I mean, yeah. just in general, because you could yeah. be you're borderline playing Iron Hills when you're playing Erebor Reclaimed, just with yeah. more pure options, but you lose Master of Battle. And yeah, things exactly. Like. So yeah. like, if you look at like how you could be playing a uh, Iron Hills focused dwarf army. Mm. You could just bring, you know, not Dane and then a bunch of Iron Hills dwarves with other hero options that are more interesting than them. Yeah. Or you could just bring, you know, Dane, a captain, and then like, you know, either two captains or you can ally in Lake Town if you want cheap mm. might. If you want cheap might, you just ally in Lake Town. You can just bring, you know, Percy and like 12 goons and that costs less than Muren and Draa. Definitely. And yes. it's three might and a bunch of bodies. Yeah. There's just, I find there's better ways to spend points in this list than bringing them. I feel like being forced to bring both and the fact that one of them just has strike, one of them just has accuracy. Yeah. I think if both of them had defense as well, I think you'd see them... So if they had more actions to use that might on... Yeah. Interesting. Again, if one of them just had march, they would be, I'd be a lot hotter on them. I'd yeah. be a lot hot, like more interested in bringing them. Yeah. I've played against Dra and quite a few times now he's only ever been a move monkey or one time in a game I played against him he dismounted someone like Percy can do that exactly any might model with a bow can do that hey, you, don't, you don't know how many points Bard is base yeah tell me 140 oh wow and he has how many bow shots uh, well it depends how good you're all but potentially three strengths so he has bow one shot. bow shot he has one to three yeah <laughs> on average two yeah with strength four three might behind a 24 inch range and can bring cheaper models. And can bring a warband of cheap models that he's bannering for. He can bring so, 18 cheap models that he yeah. banners for, and it's like 200 points. But as you only have the named heroes in a pure Iron Hills list, I think these guys do add stuff to the game. It depends on the... Like, if you're randomly playing a points value where a third captain would suck, mm. and a, you've already got, like, Dane and two captains, yeah. or something like that, bring them. They're not terrible. They have some random upsides here and there. I genuinely think these guys randomly get a lot of value at like a thousand points because it's a second source of strike across your line and it's sure, just sure. a high density. Yeah, might, at like right? a thousand points, just adding in a bunch of might that you can spread across the table is valuable. Yeah. But in most formats, it's just not super relevant in my yeah. opinion. And yeah. at that point, again, I would rather just ally stuff. Yeah, that's fair. If, you, if you're playing pure, sure. Mm. But I would rather just either bring halls from Thrandles for some fight six, or I would rather yeah. bring some debt cheap bodies from Lake Town. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, look, it depends, right? There's a lot that goes into this conversation, but I think in isolation of their list, they're a great tech in either really low points if you're not bringing Dane for whatever reason, or really high points if you want that density of might injection into your list. Yeah, and you don't want to... Specifically, if you're refusing to ally, if you want to just play pure dwarves. Exactly. I think right. if you just look at allies, you just immediately would never bring them. Yeah, I think that's the issue of a lot of things in this game, though. It, well, especially because... Things that are... Iron Hills yeah. is in what I like to call the Holy Trinity, right? You have your uh, Iron Hills, your Lake Town and your Thranduil's Hall that are all little green triangle to each other, which means you have access to anything you want under the sun. Do you which, want a shooting hero? Just bring, like, legless. a legless, right? Yeah. If you want a combat hero, just bring... Thrandall, Bard, Thorin. <laughs> any of the above like that. Well, well not Thorin, because... Well, not any of You'd have to get a reclaim, yeah. but yes. Yes, but yes. I think that's the issue when you look at these guys and a wider green alliance scheme, but when you're looking at them in the faction itself... They play a really nice role well because they add variety that's not just another captain. Yeah, if something's not your best choice and you have ally options, you have better choices. And that's the problem, yeah. But regardless, let's move on to a model that we've talked about quite a few times now, the Iron Hills Captain. Yeah, so for 80 points, you get a move of 5, a fight of 5, a strength of 4, defense 8, 2 attacks, 2 wounds, and courage 5 with a 2-1-1 classic captain profile. He has heavy armor, a war spear, a sword, and a shield base. He has heroic march, and he may exchange the war spear for a matic, which you will never do, or he can bring a war goat for 10 points, which you will do 90% of the time. He also has a master of battle 5 plus and shield wall, so he can go up to defense 9, and also when you strike into him, there's a 1 in 3 chance he strikes back. Yes. Which is obnoxious. Yeah. It just, it's a safety net that means that there's threat no matter what when you're playing against this type of dwarf list. And the Iron Hills Captain is a captain that is present in Elbow Reclaimed with Old Man Dane and with Thorn Oakenshield mm -hmm. and is the captain profile of the Iron Hills. So yes. this profile 
will be the same profile we reference when we talk about the captain in every single variation of these lists. The only difference will be Iron Hill's keyword will be sometimes changed to Erebor keyword if we bring uh, King Dane Ironfoot, the old man Dane, basically. He's basically just a porcupine. You just can't, you know, safely go into him. Yes. That's, that's what he does. Now, you mentioned that you would never swap out the Matic. I actually think the Matic is a really nice little tech in. So what the Matic is, it's a two-handed weapon which can shield, uh, which can bash or pierce and strike, right? But my problem with it is that it's forced two-hand. It is forced two-hands, but you still have a spear, uh, you still have a sword and a shield. Oh, you so you have three weapon profiles still on the oh, profile, right? Oh, never mind, never mind. Okay, I didn't and realize so, you get to keep the sword and shield. Okay, okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll accept it now. So I have the... There's a really cool captain pose, which is not the one that's uh, visualized here. It's him walking forward with a mannequin in hand. That model is the one that I use for my captain because I think, A, he looks gorgeous. Probably <laughs> the best of the captain prof, uh, uh, stances, in my opinion. But B, when he's on foot, I think that is the way you want to play him. Now, if you're mounting him on the goat, your war spear becomes a lance. Yeah, yeah. So that basically yeah. means you always bring him on the uh, with the spear and you never swap the mattock. But if he's on foot, I think you actually do the mattock more time. No, you, well, I think you always... I, I don't think yeah. he's the worst spear supporting. But like, he's not the same as... Um, like elf uh, wood elves where you can spear support fight six like spear yeah. supporting fight five isn't that valuable so yeah you may as well I, I actually yeah. yeah I didn't realize you had to keep um, the sword and shield yeah. when you go to the matic so I think that is a really 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 powerful choice you get to do with the captain and it's a bit of a shame that with the warrior profile that we're about to get into uh, in a little bit that the matic weapon swap is not the same as it is with uh, your hero but that's okay he also has shield wall. You mentioned that as well. Going to defense nine if he can do the back away properly. Phenomenal, right? Like, that's the same level of tankiness that Sauron. But he also just is a porcupine. Um, yes. Because when you charge him, you don't want to strike because he might randomly strike back. So yeah. unless you're native fight six, you just kind of suck. Yeah. You just, like, if you're fight, if you're Rohan and you charge this guy, you're like, I'm going to call a strike. And then he goes, no thanks. And you yeah. just, you clench. Yeah. Because you might just lose. And the amount of times I've seen this model like save another hero because someone caught a combat nearby him and he just popped off got on free combat and swung into someone else that too as well yeah like, he might when just... your opponent thought you had a might and you go lamau i have three models that have master battle one's a four plus two or five pluses yeah exactly that's statistically you've gotten at least one of you them. just charge him in and you go to your opponent you want to call anything and they go i'm gonna call combat and you go okay. yes yeah, sick hold on a minute yeah all right let me roll dice oh uh, i don't uh, uh, oh, next day it was next again, time again, here we go, here we go. Uh, ah, Dane got it. Dane would have gone that one And the final one? Uh, no, uh, you I, suck I suck. this game. I yeah. Jeez, go, so back, I go back to 40k. Yeah. I think that's <laughs> very much, okay? I only need to roll three ups, it's fine. Yeah, it's fair. But this model is wonderful. He's 80 points, really high points investment for a march. That's probably my one complaint with this model. Correct. Right? Because if you're looking at Erebor Reclaimed, he's the only way you bring march into your list. Unless you bring Dane. Other than the big man himself, right? Correct. Yeah. And so you're either paying 80 points or 90 points if the, uh, the other amount, or you're paying 160 points for your march, which that 160 point tax defines your list. 80 points may not necessarily define your list. Probably it does a lot of shaping what you're bringing, but it doesn't define your gameplay yet. So it's a good thing we can ally like to. <laughs> Ooh, and I think that's but it, yes, right? That's, yeah. that's the sort of thing that I always come back to is like, if I don't want it, the allies are just too good not to. The somehow. allies are just so fantastic yeah, for this exactly. entire subsection of the army slash yes. game. Yeah. Alrighty, let's jump into some of our new elbow clan stuff with King Dane Ironfoot. Alexa, tell me what this man does. So, Dane Ironfoot is 130 points. He is a dwarf variable and he is a hero of legend. Now, he is a f move of 5, a fight of 6, a strength of 4, defense of 8, 3 attacks, 3 wounds, and courage 7 with 3-3-1. Three, three, or might will fate. He has heavy dwarf armor and Berezenthul. Yeah, that was pretty close. Yeah, not bad. This is a must forged hand and a half axe, but it may as well just say two handed. Yep. Uh, he's also got heroic actions, heroic resolve, heroic strength, heroic strength, and heroic challenge. He is fearless. He's also venerable, which sounds like an upside, but really, you just have to roll two dice when you climb, leap, or jump, and you pick the lowest. Yep. So he might fall over yes. twice as often. Yep. Which means 100% of the time for me. Yeah, basically. Yep. Furthermore, friendly Erebor dwarf models, including hero models, will benefit from Dane's standfast regardless of range. Now, Chris. Yes. Does this mean you get to stand fast through walls? 
No, because his is worded slightly differently. Correct. So this is regardless of range, but you still need line of sight to benefit from Stanfast. Stanfast. Unlike Thorain. Thorain, there in, we go. Thorain in yep. um, Army of Thrall. You got it. Yep. Anywhere on the battlefield. Correct. So his one specifies anywhere on the battlefield, which means that the location of the call doesn't matter mm -hmm. because he has explicitly told you that you have automatically passed. This model says... Uh, you know, 12 inch bubble, 18 inch bubble. This guy has a infinite range, 96 inch bubble, right? But, but you that still bubble requires sight, yeah. line of sight still. Yeah. Still basically. follows normal rules. Exactly. So, what do we think of King Day? Also, we should just say he is a six inch banner for your own. Correct. Right? So, it doesn't say he... on the profile, but if you're running him, you're running it in Erebor reclaimed as the future list. Yep. And part of that is all your Iron Hills guys become Erebor, Erebor? Yep. and Dane Ironfoot becomes the target for Dubakar. So, Correct. all of your guys get Dubakar from Dane Ironfoot. Yeah. So it means that your captains, your warriors, your goats all get the uh, six inch banner rule. So if you look at this profile in isolation at 130 points, mid. It's, it's a middling list. When uh, you compare it to Thrain, who is 120 points, he's just basically worse than Thrain. Yeah, or even 125 points for uh, Dwalin. Dwalin, right? Exactly. Like he gets outshot pretty heavily. The only thing he has over Dwalin is the extra wound, but he's missing a point of strength, he's missing a mount, he's missing the versatility of the axes. Exactly, yes. Now, when you bring Dan Ironfoot, you get access to Thorin the Third, so uh, this guy's son. You also get access to Dwalin, who cannot bring a goat, unfortunately. You get access to Noi, you get access to Doi, you get access to Gloin. Gloin and Oin as well. I think it's on it's on the next one. We can we can double check that after. Yeah. Um, I think those are the heroes you get access to. So you get access to a handful of extra heroes as well, which means that uh, you get access to about half of the named Champions of Airball Hills. You get most of the about. good ones, which is what's important. Exactly, yes. So you lose, like, your... Boyn, Floy, Killy, your, like, 7 to 10th choices, basically. Exactly, yeah. And so he actually adds a lot of variety into your list uh, because of his un uh, because of his named counterparts you can bring alongside of him. And with a 6-inch banner, you basically are saving 50 points across the list by saying two banners don't aren't there because you have this guy instead. It does mean that he has to be positioned into your lines well. But he's going to be in the middle of your line anyway. That's and what you want. And if he's wanted. not, you've probably lost the game anyway. Yeah, the only like the, the, the downside is that if 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 there's someone who can challenge him in combat, you're scared. But uh, yeah. there's very few things that do that. Don't get bogged. That's most basically... things most things that can challenge him in combat cost two hundred points. Yes. And so if you're fighting something hundred and fifty points or less he's going to come out on top. I almost guarantee you that because he's built with a stat block that will absolutely crush a lot of things. Additionally, his axe is an axe, so it's two-handed with a plus one on strength four if you piercing strike, which you're probably going to do almost every time. Or well, if it's relevant. If you're fighting D5 or D7, you pierce. If you're not, you don't. Yeah. Uh, the only time you wouldn't do that is if you're fighting something that has a chance of winning back. Yes, uh, you don't. So, you don't. You don't pierce against. Well, you would against Azog. You wouldn't against Bog. Exactly. Right. Azog. It doesn't matter because he always wins at threes. Yeah, but like, there's very few times you do those piercing strikes against other heroes. But honestly, like, you should just explain to your opponent if there's defense five in the fight, I'm always piercing striking unless it's against a hero. Mm -hmm. And if that's the start of your game, then just go with that because he's a four dice hero. He's a self banner. Like, he's always a four-dice model. Just don't, roll, just don't roll a three on your uh, PS loss when you lose, and then go to D5, because yeah. that'd be very bad. But even then, it's like a two-thirds chance that against troops, your stat block doesn't even change. Mm. Or the D8 no, means well, it's six fours. Right? Uh, yeah. D7, D7 really sucks, because you lose six fours, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, at that point... Against like, strength four, though, it doesn't really matter that yeah. much. Against strength four, you only lose if you're all three. Yeah. Just one in three times. Yeah. But Either even way. then, you probably don't die. Yes. Unless you know, they roll really hard. I think he's a wonderful inclusion into the game, and he adds a lot of change of how you can play this already quite diverse set of heroes alongside your troop choices. Yeah, he is. I would say if you don't have the banners, he sucks, but that's he's kind of he's clearly pointed around being a six inch banner. Exactly. Yes. Because that, that's just how it is. Yeah. Let's talk about the other one. Chris, yes. tell us about Thorin the Third. Yeah, so Thorin the Third. Stone helm, because apparently he's without a hat. Yeah, his non-hat. His head thing. is a stone helm. Well, I mean, he's a dwarf, so he's pretty thick. But uh, um, uh, yeah, so he's movement five. Uh, he's also a dwarf airborne infantry hero of valor for 120 points. 
so he is a movement 5, fight 6, 4 plus, strength of 4, defense 8, 3 attacks, 2 wounds, courage of 6, but he is 3 might, will, and fate. So only 2 wounds, but has 3 fate to compensate. It's not terrible, it's not amazing, but hey, it's like being we'll 3 wounds, it. 1 fate. Exactly, right? On average. Uh, he has heavy armor, he has a shield, he has a hand and a half pick, which is fantastic, because it means you can do that funky, I'm randomly going to 2 hand, and it can be that. Uh, strength of five when he needs to be as well. He has strike, strength, and defense. Uh, two of the three best heroics in the game, and then heroic strength. Uh, he also has a special rule called cool headed. So, basically, whenever this model declares a heroic, he has a five plus to not spend might in doing it. That's fantastic on its own already. Uh, additionally, if uh, he declares a heroic and the en- and an enemy model declares a heroic action then he can change what his heroic is. This is a weirdly worded rule because it doesn't actually say it has to be one that you're fighting. Just as an enemy model calls a heroic back. So, you can call a combat right next to an Azog. And Azog goes, whoa, hurdy dirty do I'm going to master a battle that. And you go, oh, cool. I've, I've stuffed up. I've given him the combat. He's fight seven, I'm fight six. I'm going to safety strike now. And it doesn't cost you anything to do it. In fact, in the game, you normally can't even change your hooks anyway. So being able to do that is phenomenal. Also means you can bait things out really nicely as well. Um, means that if someone randomly decides to call a challenge into you and you call a defense, you could strike back instead. Like, mm. It's a cute little rule that basically helps if you've made the wrong choice. It's occasionally relevant. Exactly. I think it, it, you think it's better than it is. Yeah. You're like, thinking, oh, there's so many clever plays. I can outsmart. Oh, it's like, it really shouldn't come up that often. The yeah. five up might refund is neat. Um, it basically means you're four might, four, five, five sometimes. It's like a 50 50 on being five, four on average. Yeah. And so, like, it's cute. It's great. It's nice. It's a thing. Did but... this guy get. No, someone got points dropped in the proper book, didn't they? Was it Thorin? I can't remember. Oh, actually, I think he's 110. I think he's 110. Now. I think he's actually 110. I think you're right, actually. That's my fault. Yeah. Why don't you have the book here? What? Uh, because. Um... Uh, yeah, anyway, so with his other rules, right? Um, so if your force contains uh, King Dane or this guy, then all models in the Erebor claimed army list change the Iron Hill keyword for Erebor keyword. Mm-hmm. That's great. Uh, additionally, your force may not include the following models. Thorin Oakenshield, it may not include Killy, may not include Philly, because those three are dead. We know that. Because... May not include Balin, because Balin's gone off to die in Moria. May not include Bomber, because he's too fat. May not include Oyen, because no one likes him. And it may not include Dane Ironfoot, because King Dane is the new Dane. Dane. You also can't include Oyen. But you haven't lost really anyone that valuable. Exactly. And then um, yeah, Balin loses the war goat. Yep. And then you get a changed allies matrix where you get Garrison of Dayless Historical if you have King Bard or sorry King De- King Brand or Prince Bard yeah and, and then, then you become yellow with everything uh, that exists around that time basically <laughs> yep and red with everything else like it did previously yeah so it's pretty good I think he's an alright choice at 110 points he's actually pretty good I think as a maybe third or fourth piece hero I think on his own, like I'd rather bring a hundred and fifteen point to Arlen over him, to be honest with you. But That's, I think he's got the same problem. He's pointed around being in the legendary legion where he's a three inch banner. Yeah, and I think that's his problem. <laughs> that's right? the problem for him. That's the problem with, with that that was the problem with all of the heroes when they initially came out. They were pointed for um for legions. For right? legions. Yeah. Like all the New Dale heroes were pointed to be three inch banners. Three inch banners or giving out the uh what do you call Bodyguard. it? Sworn protector rule, right? Like yeah. Which is unfortunate, because it means as a standalone profile, he just suffers. Yeah, but it does mean that you do have variety in what you're doing outside of that, so it's not the end of the world. Yeah, at least but... in this force, you have other options for named heroes, so the fact that he's overcosted outside of Legion, it doesn't really matter. Yes. I think the king, phenomenal, because of that banner. Well, effect, again, no matter what. If right? he's, yeah, he's the banner always, so you don't need to be in Legendary Legion to get value. But this guy, I think the only time I'd see him is in Legion, or do what I do, I use him as just a captain. Because Excellent. he looks cool. Right? He does, he does. So, but, yeah. That's the weird one. Yeah. Um, shall we move on to our final little subsection? The troop choices of all three of these factions. <laughs> we have the Iron Hill Dwarf. For 11 point space, you get a Dwarf Iron Hill Infantry Warrior with a move of 5, a fight of 4, a strength of 4, a defense of 7, 1 attack, 1 wound, and courage 4 with heavy armor, sword, and shield. They come with shield wall base, so they can be defense 8. They may exchange their shield for a Matic. 
They may exchange their shield for a crossbow for one point, or they may get a spear for one point or a banner for 25. The Matic, it will describe it now, is a two-handed weapon that can use either bash or piercing strike. So you end up with a Matic and sword. So you can one hand or two hand, but you lose your shield, which means you go to D6. Six. And you have a Western pit of uh, profile pointing in shield wall. Yes. Which, I think... Well, I don't think you paid for shield wall. It's it like half feels, a point. It just feels a bit bad to have shield wall in your rule, and your captain keeps it when they get a Matic, but these guys don't. Yeah, but, That's then, you, but then you'd me. have to pay a point for the Matic. Yeah, I don't. I wish they'd swap the sword for it, like force two hand, but keep a shield. But if you're forced to hand, you can't use your shield. Well, you can shield and keep your shield wall when you back away. Uh, could you keep that anyway? You'd stay at defense seven, basically. They could have made it maybe. Uh, maybe the shield just shouldn't be base. Yeah. <laughs> maybe the shield should be at one point upgrade, and they should cost ten points. Maybe. That, and then actually. you could bring your matic, and then you spend a point for matic, and you can bring a shield matic sword. Yeah, something like that. Right? And you carry four weapons. Yeah. Yeah, it's the ones it tracks. Yeah. I mean, it's your not captain quite, is... It's not quite a Riverdale knight, so it's fine. That's right? true. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Iron Hill Dwarves are the best non-half-troll like half troll troop in the game. In terms of just raw stats. Yeah, basically. Outside of like elves, because fight is better. But anyway, in terms of like raw toughness and damage, they are the best. Yes. Strength 4 means that you're wounding 90% of your other troop choice in the game on fives. Anything that's not dwarves, basically. But yeah, literally, right? It's dwarves or a Gondor shield wall. And but... D7 means that everything is winning. You're on sixes, that's not... A hero. The half trolls. Yeah, half trolls would be fives, right? But even that, it's like... Yeah. Your dwarf punching power is so high anyway, and you have shield wall to make you D8. Yes. Which means there's literally nothing outside of burly style models or monsters that are going to be wounding you outside of sixes. If you're shield walling, a lot of things hit you six fours, which really sucks. Yeah. And that alone... Makes these guys with the sword and board front row and the spear shield combo second row phenomenal, right? A block of 10 of these guys. I have physically seen 10 of these models hold up two warbands of elves and <laughs> yeah, actually kill them. Yeah, there was that one game we played where I, I had like, I was playing my Lake Town dwarf list and I sent, he had, I think he had like 12 Palace Garden. Celebron. Yeah, it was Celebron, like, and like seven or eight pikes, four swordsmen, and two rangers. And I said, oh, like, I'm sorry. And yeah. it was like a tight choke, and I just put ten dwarves there, and it, they tanked the entire time, killed half the elves while Bard Thorin just ran through the actual line. Yeah, and I, I think we fought eight or nine combats. <laughs> yeah, and like five dwarves died, half the elves died. Yeah. Celebron got through eventually. Celebron, I think, eventually killed. I think uh, he just like killed stuff, combated to like chase the children or something. I yeah, can't remember. He did, I, he did something not relevant. But basically. they they did such a because they were able to shield wall the entire time. They were basically unbreakable. Yes, and, and they it, slowly eventually won fights. Yes, and my troop choice is just sixes fours hurt so bad to actually try and do those wounds on because I was rolling a lot of sixes initially, but those fours I just wasn't transitioning. And it literally halves the damage compared to sixes to wound. Basically, yeah. Oh, uh, uh, not basically. Not basically. Objectively. That's just that's yes. just what it does. Yeah, it just is what it does. <laughs> it's what it does. It halves your odds. And so suddenly, in ten like ten models, hundred and fifteen points literally held up about three hundred and twenty points of elves. And we if you, if you traded, can't trap them, you can't kill them. We traded so evenly on those kills, even with a hero type. But it wasted that. so much time. Yes. And it cost so many points and to that, get those. Even that trades. alone was the reason I lost. Because I lost that game like six four. I'm pretty sure. Uh, no, I'm pretty sure that one was pretty decisive. Because Bard and Thorin just slaughtered everything. Yeah, maybe that's yeah. That, either that way, one though, wasn't close. Yeah. <laughs> but like the fact that that just like can happen to anything, like it doesn't matter if you're fighting Urukai with a pike line back doesn't matter if you're fighting into... Urukai are still sixes, yeah. Exactly, right? And they're equal points to you, and you're and killing the... them on fives, yeah. and they're your same fight. Yeah. And at that point, shield wall doesn't even matter, so you can spread your line thinner yeah. against them and get behind their pikes. You and just then you're so suddenly well. winning, yeah. and you're killing them back on fives. The only thing you have to worry about then, the shield wall matters against their heroes, because their heroes will chop through you, because they're true, strength true, five, true, so true, you true. do want to be careful. Like, Lurts will just eat Mulch you. Yeah. But um, it just means that, like, this army can play so flexibly with one singular infantry troop choice because of how diverse they are. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, crossbows. <laughs> oh, yeah, they're all right. Yeah, strength four, stand or shoot, that's The main issue for them is the such expensive crossbows. Yeah, a 12 point profile, stays at defense six at least. It is nice. Basically, you're paying 13 points for your crossbows because you're probably going to put a spear on them for when they fight in the lines. Because you want to be able to have your shooting models engage in close quarters combat. Mm. I think you're wasting so much points 
if you're not investing your shooting unit in the combats eventually. Especially for this list. Like, if you're yes. playing, like, Lake Town and you put five guys on the flank and it's, like, 30 points, it's whatever. Yeah. When it gets, like, 60 points, though, for, like, this army, it's not worth it. Yeah, literally. If you put five crossbows in a building somewhere, that's literally 60 points. Which or is not good. 65 points if you put spears on them. Yeah. It hurts. So, yeah. Anyway, on to uh, our next strip choice. Yeah, tell me about the goats. Yeah, so... The Iron Hills Goat Rider is a Dwarf Iron Hills Cavalry Warrior for 20 points. Their movement 5, scratch that, movement 8. Their fight 4, 4 plus, strength of 4, defense 6, because they don't have a shield. 1 attack, 1 wound, and courage of 4. Their war gear is heavy armor, sword, war spear, and the war gear itself. They can exchange their uh, war spear for a manic. Don't do it, it's a trap. Yeah, this one I don't understand. Yeah, the banner... For 25 points is your other war gear option. It's probably not worth it. I like mounted banners, but I would not do a 45 point mounted banner. If you're going really heavy on the goats? Sure. Yeah, okay, if you're going mass goats, sure. But uh, then like a normal balanced list. No. I think if you have more than six cavalry bases, putting a banner on them doesn't matter and it's fine. Outside of that though, probably not going to do it. Uh, the war goat itself is a movement eight. Uh, fight two, doesn't really matter. Strength four, doesn't really matter. Defense of 5, so heavy armor, which is great. One wound, courage of 3, but they have the Mountain Dweller special rule as well, which is awesome. Now, the rule that really makes goats turn up is when this model charges into combat against one or more man size or smaller models, roll a d6 for each. On a 5 plus, the model is immediately knocked prone. Basically, a third of the time you're fighting when you're charging, you are immune to strikes back. Or parving when they have spears. Exactly. But still, it is strong. absurd. The fact that you can run into a hero and on a five up just go on the mouth. Even better, down. see what you actually do is you charge your goat, you knock the hero prone, then you charge your foot hero into the guy you've knocked prone, then you make your goat fight the other guy and your foot hero fights him one by one. Exactly. And yes. the guy's now prone and your guy just goes. And, and kills if him. that hero is the same fight as you, they're probably going to safety strike to stay alive. Which and you means can just, you just got a free resource out of them. Yeah. You just don't need to do anything. Yeah. Because you're at no risk of dying back, right? And if you do it two or three turns in a row, like, it's phenomenal. And the fact that you can just do that every single time you charge to every infantry base you fight is wonderful. So these guys, 20 points. They're expensive, don't get me wrong. They're very pricey. But cavalry are cavalry. No matter how expensive a cavalry base is, even an Easterling Cataphract at 16 points if you're paying for the fight four... <laughs> will still have huge value because it's an inf- it's a cavalry base size that can do knockdowns and has maneuverability. Cavalry are powerful. This is just a model that you're probably not going to bring more than four of in a game. They're too expensive to spam, like some cav, but yeah, yeah. you just bring like t- two to four every game, probably depending on your one point to four, size. probably, I'd say. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, I have one in my list, so. Yeah. But yeah. I think depending on the type of list you're playing, you don't necessarily need the goats in your list at all. But I think they're just so good that there's very little reason not to consider bringing at least one, basically. Yes. All right. On to the Pew Pew. The Ah, Ballista. Yes. Everyone's favorite unit, right? So for 90 points, you get a siege weapon. Uh, For 125 points. Sorry, for 125 points. You're correct. I'm sorry. It's... Yeah, this is a lie. This is a bit ridiculous, honestly. Anyway. (laughs) um, So it's a siege engine. You get three four dwarves with heavy armor and swords. One is a siege veteran, as usual. Uh, you could, you got your goons. They're just normal Iron Hill goons. You can get a captain for 75. Superior construction for 15. An additional dwarf crew for 10. It's the cheapest dwarves in the list. Spam them. <laughs> uh, it is reliable, so it will only scatter three rather than six. Furthermore, the crew may reroll ones to hit. Okay, pretty good. The old twirly whirlies. So you always count as declaring a heroic shoot without spending mites. You always fire first, and you get volley fire. When the ballista hits a target, place a marker at the center of the target model and draw a line from the ballista to the to marker. Shooting attacks that are strength 6 or less cannot target any models within 3 of the line for the remainder of the turn. Additionally, shooting attacks that are strength 6 or less cannot be made if they cross the line at any point. If a shooting attack that is strength 7 or more targets a model uh, within 3 of it or cross the line, roll a d6 on a 5 plus and shooting attack is prevented. At the end of the turn, remove any markers placed to this roll. So basically, you just turn off your opponent's shooting. Yeah. Uh, which is pretty ridiculous and uh, yeah you shoot first so you can't even get shot back 
Yes. So unless your opponent calls a heroic shoot back, in which case you can't. It basically just turns off shooting. Yeah. It's pretty ridiculous. Uh, and then additionally, it has a tremendous impact. If an Iron Obelisk scores a hit against a battlefield target, all men size of smaller models within two inches are knocked to the ground. Cavalry models within two must take a throw and rider test. Additionally, any models within two also strength for strength for hit. So it's a big AOE explosion that one shot someone as well. Yeah. It's it's a lot of damage, but it's too many points. It's strength eight as well. It's not actually strength ten, which surprised Why me. Why is it strength eight? Well, I don't know. It just is strength eight. It, it, it really surprised me the first time I saw it actually use that strength eight, which means it won't one tap things very well. Um, Why is it strength eight? Yeah, I don't know. It's defense ten and four wounds as well with the blister itself, so it can be targeted. If you're shooting back at it, it's not gonna die at all unless it's other crossbows and even then unless you shoot it with like a ballista first yeah it's like, overwhelming you're... firepower to actually destroy this thing but at 120 even at 90 points to be honest with you 90 points it's just good because it cheats shooting out of the game yeah at 125 means... you're paying too many points for that yeah and i think being able to gimmick shooting out sometimes is gonna be huge right because if you're fighting like an elf list fantastic if you're fighting corsairs because the amount of throwing weapons phenomenal but if you're playing into a list that doesn't really play the shooting game very well or has ways around it, like, this thing really doesn't actually do that much against them other than make you walk towards It's still a 4-plus hit. Yeah, even if it rerolls ones, a 4-plus hit still It's like hit. maybe, what, 55-60% at best to hit, which is just not... Uh, good. Yeah, which... Like, that reroll ones to hit doesn't give you that much better math. Yes, and so I think if you look at this thing as successfully getting 4 shots off over the course of a game, hitting twice. If let's say let's give, ben, give benefit. Let's say it hits three of those four shots over the course of a game. Is that going to kill 125 points worth of stuff? Probably not. It's no. got volley fire, so if you get within that 12 inch bubble, it's not it going to be very useful. It. Now it does have volley fire, which means it's really easy to shoot over the top of terrain and that sort of stuff as well, which is nice. But I just don't think it's that good. I think. You and I have the same issue with siege weaponry, where I think siege weapons are fine for what they do, but more times than not are just too expensive for the points. I think like the only one I think I genuinely consider is the Dwarf Ballista in Kazadoom. Well, you're just objectively wrong, because the Avenger Bolt though exists. But outside that's of those, not a siege yeah. weapon, that's a bow. Yeah, that's a crossbow. <laughs> that's yeah. a crossbow. <laughs> but I think outside of those type of really small, really cheap siege weapons, I think the Isengard Ballista has a place in the game, just not a very fun one. Uh, as well like only when it's in the list that makes it literally twice as accurate yeah that's the only time you'd ever win the Isengard one because otherwise I just don't think it's worth it the dwarf one is great because it offers something to that list and it's so cheap and it's cheap it's enough so to work cheap. that's why it's good and then the Avenger bolt throw functions like a bow so it always has value yeah and so those I think are the only siege weapons that I would genuinely say are competitive in the game I think if oh you I see don't know some... seven heads Savage head doesn't work <laughs> if you're fighting elves. I'm sorry, but like no, because I'm gonna bring my merchant of whatever the the merchant guard, and then yeah, I'm gonna I'm yeah. gonna make your Aragorn run away on turn one. So we're playing for a 300 odd point combo. Correct. That I have to be within 12 inches of the no six inches of the merchant king, and I have to have rolled snake eyes or really low on my courage check. Correct. And I've had to had what a a uh, troll hit a uh, troll catapult hit yeah and not scatter correct this is worth it yes cool. every right, time. anyway yeah. <laughs> so yeah. shall we move on to the chariot then oh uh, yes do I get to talk about this uh, I cr- unfortunately okay so thankfully it's a very easy profile to understand right? it's only three pages long yeah well one of them is the well, champion four actually right? yeah but anyway so the champion uh, the champions the, the chariot more. yeah very good the chariot itself is 175 points that's its starting points. Uh, the chariot crew are uh, move five, fight four, defense. Uh, sorry, fight four, four plus, strength four, defense six, one attack, one wound, coach four. Cool. The chariot itself is movement eight. It's fight four, it's strength four. It is defensive eight and two attacks. Its wounds is five and it is courage of three. The war gear, which is a bit ambiguous, is heavy armor and a sword, so apparently the chariot has heavy armor and a sword. Fascinating. Um, I don't know if the sword maybe is meant to be the spokes on the side or whatever that is, but that's okay. And it has two war gear options. One of those is a captain for 75 points. So a five point discount for your captain. That's not bad. And the second one is the champions of Erebor for 325 points. Now, this model is fearless. No matter how you bring it, this model has monstrous charge. 
Uh, it also has a uh, rule talking about how chariots interact that basically regurgitate the phrase monstrous charge. What that means is if this thing charges, even against other cavalry models, it still gets all of its native cav bonuses. Mm-hmm. Um, it won't knock you over if you're not strength 6. Over your strength 6 or higher, sorry, but it will always get extra dice and knock you over your strength 5 or lower. Uh, the Dwarven crew... Uh, so a single Dwarf can replace any crew member uh, by walking into best contact with the chariot. And the uh, crew member would essentially drop any of their spear, shield, mannix, crossbows, or banners, if they have any, to jump in and go to only having a sword as the war gear option. Uh, if the driver is killed for whatever reason, another Iron Hills warrior can immediately take their place and just place that on the top, um, which is really nice and handy as well. And the chariot has a bolt thrower as well attached to it. So this is a rapid fire bolt thrower as a special rule, which... Uh, any Iron Hill Dwarf that is not the driver may man the rapid fire bolt thrower. This is a crossbow that fires d6 shots per turn and has a limited field of view for 45 degrees from the front of the base. It's a weird oval base and there's a little picture describing how that kind of works uh, later on. So if you're a bit confused, genuinely I'd recommend photocopying that page or scanning that page enlarging the photo size to be the size of your base itself and being able to just like lay that over the top of something to show where that angle is basically that cuts out all the arguments and does something about you can even like cut just the actual like angle itself out and have that just placed over the base and laminated i've seen someone do that and it works really well um the chariot can shoot even if it's engaged in combat which is great and it can even shoot uh engaged models with it basically without it in the way of the chariot itself all the time if you decide to shoot uh, however that model that shoots may not add their dice to the fight so there is a slight downside to this model on that front but that's okay um when the chariot charges like I said um it gets all it's knocked down and that sort of stuff but has the same movement shenanigans stuff that the uh what are they called? Candish chariots have? Yep. Yeah. Well, it moves uh, a little bit. So these ones move four inches before pivoting instead of three inches. And it can pivot 45 degrees. Then it can move another full and pivot again. Um, now, that is really good in the fact that it can pivot. But it's frustrating that it does have that restricted movement. Um, when it does get things like transfixed or compelled, you can't have it turn around because that's just how the rules are written, but you can stop it moving at least. You can forfeit your normal movement to have it spin any direction you want, Tokyo drifted around to set up for the next turn, but that's going to be a bit tricky. But that's okay. Uh, now, how do you kill a chariot? That's the magic question. Oh. Yes. We're almost there, I swear. The chariot in magic, the chariot in combat. Yes. The chariot in charging. Uh, so, the uh, chariot is a 4 plus in the way whenever people try to hurt people in the chariot, basically. So you can target the chariot with no in the way, or just like a fell beast when you're shooting at it and things like that, you roll a 4 plus when you're trying to damage it, uh, when you're trying to kill the crew members and that sort of stuff. Uh, the chariot also can never be trapped, never counts as trapped, stuff like that. So you'll never double your strikes against it, but you can, because it's such a big base, get a huge number of dice into it. Um, which is great. You have the large war machine rule, which basically is monstrous charge. You can ignore that. You have the uh, chariot and magic, which basically says, like I said earlier, you can transfix it. You can't make it spin around, but you can uh, transfix it. Um, basically, magical powers such as sorceress blast and things like that as well don't move it and don't knock it prone either. Um, any damage effects affected by it will affect it, but you're not going to displace it by hurling it d6 inches off of a... Uh, what do you call it? Or off a sorceress blast. So there's that as well. And finally, the Iron Hills Captain. So if you bring an Iron Hills Captain, you'll raise the fight value of this model to fight five, but the driver never contrib- contributes its attacks to the chariot, which means that the captain is going to give it fight five and going to give it a nice big fat platform to uh, do your moves and that sort of stuff off of, but that's about all it's going to do. Because your captain has to be the one driving it if he's on the chariot. So, that was a huge amount of words we just regurgitated. What are your thoughts on the chariot? It's fine. Yeah? It's a lot of words for an it's fine model. Unfortunately, that's kind of just my opinion. My my one tech use of it is to bring the captain 
on the chariot in 750 in my like town list yeah because i think it's funny but i've never run that so i don't know how good it is i think it's good in theory i, I think i had like 30 models barred in the chariot and it makes you yeah. actually have a lot of shooting threat and then you have this big heavy threat you have a lot of bannered models that can take space while yeah. this like 250 point beastie is just like putting pressure on yeah but i could see that going wrong in certain matchups but in theory yeah. it's pretty good I've played as a chariot a few times now, and I've played against the chariot quite a lot of times now. In my experience, it is a decidedly average model without the captain to make it fight five. And even with the captain, because you do get your massive battle steal, you do get a whole bunch of perks of that, and it's a huge base to call a move on, or to catch that base in someone else's move. Mm -hmm. So it does have value like that. But I think chariots work really well when they can kind of sideswipe across the back of someone's line mm -hmm. like the dream is this chariot is barely touching base with the front row of combat and hitting all the spear supports right mm -hmm. uh, the other thing as well the chariot does impact hits when it charges so uh, yeah i wrote that the sides it's okay yeah um so it does i think it's three, three strength six hits I'm yeah like. that's it yeah three strength three hits which, strength six yes it's good. So strength three did you I? said strength oh, three, sorry. which is a lot worse than yes. strength six. Three strength six hits. There we I go. Wouldn't, yeah, nerf it a little bit. I don't mind. Yeah. But it basically, the dream with this model is because it's doing what a mumok does, where you can march a mumok mm -hmm. and impact hit things anyway, the dream with this model is to march and move 11 inches. And you want to, like, sideswipe an entire battle line and just impact hit down the entire line. My cute tech was to try and put um, Bane, Son of Bard in combat with it to call a free combat for it. Yeah, that's something my like cute that, tech. Right? But it's like, it's very. You put a lot of effort in for maybe a good reward, or you could just have a better list. Yes. But I don't think it's bad. I think you can make it work. I think it's hard in Iron Hills because you'll end up with a really low model count if you're on it, especially with a captain on top. Yeah. Like 250 points is a huge chunk in Iron Hills. Now, being said, 250 points, so that can still lead models at least. Yeah, you, 175 you could... points that just taxes a list. Exactly. Well, yeah. but the thing is then you don't need as many heroes to lead models. But either way, you end up with a similar hero count, I think. Yeah. Like, you could go Dane this and fill out both warbands for, like, 29 models, and that's probably, like, 750 or 800 points. Yeah. And that's the type of list I've played quite a lot now, actually. Um, but I just think it gets you probably... not very good use. And even though it gets quite a few attacks once it actually does its charge and all that sort of stuff, I think it can get up to five attacks. But it's like, it's like such excess because the thing is you yeah. can't hit more than two models. You can, well, you, you actually, you really only ever hit one model with it, right? Because um, the first model, you can't like... The first time you do impact hits, you'll be able to hit two models, guaranteed. Every other impact hit, the stars have to basically align for you to simultaneously impact. So yeah, you'll basically only... Because you're moving in a straight line, it's borderline impossible to hit two models. I think the first time you move, if you do a nice pivot, well, you'll be able to yeah, pivot yeah, into yeah. It, if you right? get like a perfect pivot angle and your opponent's set it up in the right way, you can do it. But the problem is, you have so many attacks to kill one guy. Yeah, and and you can't call combats with the captain either. Yeah, so you can't call a combat. You have to have someone else there to do the move combat for it, which yeah. is really hard if you're playing pure Iron Hills because you have so few heroes and they yeah. don't want to. Now you've put Dane and this chariot in the same spot and you don't want that. And you've just lost the entire back half of your battle. Line and now you've, anyway. yeah, you've got yeah. 400 points fighting here. What, what's happening on the rest of the table? Yeah. So that's why I think like in, in, in Lake Town with like Bane calling a combat first thing, it can be interesting. Yes. But outside of that, I just think it's too expensive and it won't kill enough unless you get really lucky. Yeah. Or your opponent really messes up. Exactly. Yes. And now, it can just die. Yes. Now there's one thing about the chariot that is phenomenal. And that is called the Champions of Erebor, right? So the Champions of Erebor, right? You have to, like, close your eyes with me and just picture putting Balin, putting Dwalin, putting Philly, and putting Killy on the top of this thing, right? So what you've just done is you've put 10 points of might on the top of this base, right? That you can't use. You can use them all. So all the so the one person has to drive, which is a bit annoying, right? Mm -hmm. But isn't it always Balin, Balin, Balin is your driver? Balin, yeah. So your worst fighter is always your driver yeah. anyway, right? You fight six because you have Dwalin on there. Mm -hmm. He provides three attacks, mm -hmm. four as well. Oh no, not four because he's not infantry. He'll provide three attacks. Sorry, you have Philly that will provide two. You have Killy that will provide two. So you've gone to what is that? Uh, three, five, seven attacks. You'll have two from the chariot. And then you have one because you've charged. You have mm -hmm. 10 attacks on this model mm -hmm. if you're charging. Nine attacks if you're not charging, mm -hmm. right? Yep, into one model. Exactly. 
It's fantastic. So you're going right? to really kill that warrior of Gondor. Oh, you're going to mulch that warrior of Gondor, right? <laughs> but here's the real fun part, Get right? Then. You play this model at 500 or 550 points, mm-hmm. and that's your entire list. Yeah. Full stop. Because your opponent has to deal with them. Because they have the crossbow anyway. They can shoot you back at it as well. Like, like, that's when this model gets fun. And all you guys can do all their special strikey, like, funky little bits and bobs on them as well. And you can do, like, uh... You can do all of your, like, stabs, feints, fe- You don't want to feint, though, because like the chariot right? loses the value. Well, that's the only problem, right? So the entire profile gets dropped if you choose to feint, but the piercing <laughs> strike the doesn't matter. Effects and stuff. That's quite yes. funny. And so there's that, right? Mm-hmm. And it means you have effectively nine points of might that can strike, and because you have Balin on the top of it, you can reroll your priority rolls. But you can't call combats with it. But I don't even think you need to. Well, I've was... played this model once as the champions of Herbal, and I've had the best bloody time of my life. I think your opponent probably wanted to punch you. Oh, my opponent was very unsatisfied with the end of the game because he tried to doomstack me once and lost six models in a turn. And never did that again, but then couldn't do anything because he didn't want to commit his leader to the fight, which is his only striking model, who was a fight five model, and I was fight six base. And with the amount of might I had behind it, it was a matter of time before I won a fight. Yeah, sounds uh, fascinating. So, uh, that's our last model. Yeah, it's a fun model for you, probably not very fun for your opponent, unless you're ready to have a beer hammer style, you know, laughing. Yeah, bring a Balrog against it, that'll be funny. That's a good style matchup, right? Because you can pull the Balrog's uh, whip stuff across and do a whole bunch of funky stuff. It's like it. a fun, dumb game. And then the Bat Swarm comes in and the game ends, right? Uh, yeah. Shoot it with the crossbow. Hmm? The Bat Swarm with the crossbow. Yeah. yeah. It's, well, basically, can you kill the Bat Swarm before the game ends? At least you're faster than the Balrog. No, nah, it's going to whip you because you have to turn and pivot. So you actually. No, nah, it's going to a straight line off the board. <sighs> Alrighty, we're going to take a very quick break. We'll see you guys in just a moment. Welcome back, guys. We're back from a little break, and we're going to talk about some allies and lists. So, this list has a lot of allies. Yes. A lot of, as we've alluded to multiple times, a lot of really good allies. Now, the two best ones are Lake Town and Thrandall's Halls. Yep. Lake Down lets you bring lots of cheap bodies, cheap might, big banner, like kind of everything that you want to augment expensive baseline troops with. Yeah. Or Halls lets you go even more elite and make your line fight six. Yes. Which is also really good. <laughs> so I think... Which do you think is scarier? Well, in my opinion, the fight six is better purely because you also get access to terror across your line. That's true. Actually, and I yeah. think model count kind of falls off really hard. Mm. At a certain number. Like, going from 50 models to 80 models... I think it really depends on the points you're playing. I think Yeah, it, it kind of who cares at a certain point. But going from 40 models to 50 models does make a difference. And doing 50 models with Terror at that super high points level, that turns up. So, so for me, I think around 750, you probably go from around 30 to 40 by switching to Lake Down. If you bring... Yeah. If you, well, there's a few ways. So if you want to go just pure bodies, you can bring two small heroes from Lake Town, like a Captain and, like, Hilda or Percy. I was going to say, Captain and Hilda, that gives you 24 models plus mm-hmm. your two heroes. For, like, 150 points. points. So yeah. if you want to really bulk out model count, that's what you do. Yeah. Or you can alternatively bring Bard and Bane. You'll get less model count, but you'll get a 12-inch banner and you'll get mass free hero combats. Yeah. So you've got two options with Lake Town. You can go, like, full horde support for cheap. Or, or you can go some, some powerful heroes, utility... Which I think is also... I think both are really good. Yeah. Um, but then maybe bring the Thandil's Hall side of it, you get some punch, because you have that bubbler plus one to win yep. and Thandil. You have that terror line, mm-hmm. and you have the access turn of to fight six. And the turn of knock prone. Yeah. Which is massive for a strength four army. But you've reduced your model count even further by bringing that model. You're not that far behind, because the dwarves are 12 points. Elves aren't actually that much more expensive. In yeah, fact, but they're normal, 11 to 14. The normal shield elves are cheaper. That is true. Normal shield jobs are only 10. But your Thrandall is minimum 155 points for a useful one. You probably bring a 160 point Thrandall. Yeah. Minimum. And a lot of people like the Elk. And so I think you're probably looking at closer than 180 mark for your Thrandall. Yeah, it depends how you want to run him. But that's the, one of the nice things with Thrandall. He is that uh, versatile. He's 100 to 195 points. Yeah, exactly. Right? You, you can, can do, you can do whatever you want with him depending on the points you're playing. If you're playing like eight to 900 points, yeah, sure. Bring the yeah. full kit. Bring like an 18 warband. Like bring... 
you know, eight palace guard and like yeah, ten two kitchen miles. sinks, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and that warband will cost about as much as your Dane warband. It's probably much more than that. No, because like I said, your non palace guard elves are two points cheaper, one to two points cheaper. Yeah, your but your kitchen elves... sinking out your Thranduil, he's thirty points up already. Yeah, that's so, that's probably the, either way. So it balances out roughly. It's expensive. It's like maybe twenty points more. But your cab are really good with Thranduil as well. Your cab are phenomenal. and they're cheaper than goats by a lot. They're sixteen points, seventeen, seventeen with a shield. I yeah. think. Either way, you get fight five cavs that have a banner on them within six of Thranduil, which is yeah. very powerful. You lose your punch power, but you do have the elf profile, which gets plus one to wound if they're within three of them. Which is pretty broad. Which may as well be that punch anyway. Well, the, the main issue there, um, the reason I pref- would prefer the foot Thranduil if you bring the palace guard is because can you be want him, the line. You want him with the line, with the dwarves, to make the dwarves fight six, to put the terror on your dwarf line, and then you play like the yeah. cab on the flank. And if the cabs are playing perfectly, they've gone onto the spear sports anyway, and are getting within that three inch bubble. Or at the, at the very least, they're within six with the banner effect, exactly. which is the main right. thing, because yeah. it makes them really reliable. So I think both sides of that is really good. Now, do you ever bring Dale without the Legion? Dale without the Legion? Yes, would you ever ally Dale without the Legion? Yes, I think you probably would actually. Justify. So I think Dale on its own works really, really well uh, as its own little self-contained faction because you have that, you know, the 3 plus shoot value and you have the uh, bodyguard in the Legion, right? Mm -hmm. Bring them out of that, uh, I think there's really good value in bringing Dane Ironfoot Mm -hmm. uh, along with some, uh, like, the Double Kings, I think, is really good, Mm -hmm. right? Now... Probably what you end up doing is you have to bring them in Legion. At that point, you put them in Legion. If you bring yeah, Batman, you have right. the Legion buff characters. But the only reason I don't like that is you lose your 3 plus shoot value for bringing the Legion. You also lose 3 inches of banner on uh, Dane. But to gain a 3 inch banner on one of the yeah, other yeah. heroes. So it balances out. So I think in Legion, I think it's actually really interesting. I think you actually... Because you have to bring one named hero that's From human each. and one named hero that's a dwarf. Mm-hmm. So I think what you do is you bring the two cheapest heroes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, as in, like, you bring both princes, basically. Because mm-hmm. both princes provide banner effects mm-hmm. and they get that little combat... Uh, like free Interaction, yeah, Interaction yeah. off each other. They're the cheapest ones you can do, 100 mm-hmm. points and 110, respectively. They're mm-hmm. the two you do every time. Yeah. Then you bring one of your cheapo heroes as well. Like a Captain of Dale. Exactly. Or like Aaron So your Captain of Dale is your 55 point mm-hmm. uh, captain. I think he's your tech in with a bow, importantly, in that profile, mm-hmm. right? Because I think you want, even though it's a 4 plus shoot value, you want that might point on bow and marching, right? Mm-hmm. If you have access to a higher points game, that's when this Legion really turns up, right? If you can bring all four and it's not feels bad, yeah. It's pretty huge, yeah. Like, I know a couple of guys who've played a 1500 point game. <laughs> It's a huge points investment, right? But, like, they had the model count. At that point, you may it. as well bring every good named hero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they bought all four of the named ones, yeah, Gloin like, and two captains, two. one of each. Yeah, that sounds about right. And it was a really fun game. They didn't fill all their warbands. Obviously, there was a more narrative game because 1,500 points, no one's playing. At that point, you don't want to fill all your warbands, honestly. Exactly. You're getting such ridiculous points. So you you want to have fun and bring all the toys. Yeah, you yeah. don't want to just max model count and hoard out your game, right? Yeah, yeah. And the game worked really well for that. The only other thing to consider is because you can do your 3 plus shoot value outside of Legion, mm-hmm. yeah, it feels a bit bad, but you can do Dane, uh, like King Dane, and Prince uh, Brand, right? Yeah, yeah. You have to bring a named hero outside of Legion as well, which is a bit dumb, but oh well. Yeah. But you do those two as your named hero, and Brand has the, you charge me, I get plus one to Yeah, win, yeah, which is solid right? defensively. Which means even though your model count is quite low now, you actually want to be losing move offs you can kind of give your opponent priority and then your knights of dale and he tanked the front exactly yeah. and if you mix your knights of dale with some dwarves you can either tech in your high fight value or high defense value or your plus one to wound bubbles depending on how you gain this and what your opponent's bringing like if it's a bunch of strength three you don't need the d7 out front so you may as well put the plus one to wound out front exactly but then conversely if they're bringing like urukai maybe you bring some you put the d7 uh, out front just to, to take those again. initial hits and then use your plus one to wound guys on the flanks and that sort of stuff but it, it, it is it is tricky I think probably you play it in Legion more times than not because you do have crossbows anyway um, and, and then your you crossbows can, can be your and you also have the bow count carry yeah because you share your bow count now, rather so than having to be separate but it does mean you bring crossbows instead of strength three bows which I personally almost always prefer move and shoot. They're, they're, not only are they cheaper, they can move and shoot. Yeah. Because bows are effective two points because you lose a shield, which is one point, so yeah. it's effective two points. 
as yeah. opposed to although I screwed up both the two points as well. So exactly, actually balances it, out, hey? it, it counts as the same for that point anyway, but. It hurts to pay two points for an Askoth bow. That is a four plus, plus shoot yes. value. Yes, that is wrong. So, it's tricky. And, like, look, Dale is only saving one point compared to the elf profiles anyway um, for their shooting value. Mm-hmm. But the fact that you can bulk them out so easily outside of that shooting also value. Also, that cheap heroes are actually the big thing. For them. Yeah, because it's bulking. 55 points for a captain, mm-hmm. right? But an elf captain is, like, 80. Yeah. Probably 75 points for most elf captains. Aren't they 75 base and then you get them? No, in high elves and lawful in the seventy base. I thought it was seventy five. Oh well, it doesn't really matter yeah. too much. It's a lot more points than a Dale captain. Exactly, minimum twenty points up, right, for this type of stuff that you're doing. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's when that conversation comes into play. But that only is really relevant with the Lord of the Rings era stuff, the Hobbit era style lists. So the Erebor reclaimed with King Under the Mountain, Thorin, and with Dane on the pig. Those lists have their own matrix anyway, and they're part of that holy trinity. And their allies are phenomenal. Exactly. You, right? If you really want to optimize, you want to look at allies, I think. Yeah. And so, and like the other nice thing is that holy trinity means that if you play Erebor dwarves, uh, like with uh, Thorin dwarves, mm-hmm. or Dane in Iron Hills dwarves, you're green with the other two no matter what yeah. still. You are yellow with each other, which is a bit frustrating but it just means that you can't bring the best parts of Dane it just means you can't get Dane on 4 plus Master of Battle yeah with basically Thorin. basically right but you are green with Thranduil and with Survivors in mm-hmm. both of those lists yeah. which means that it's a little trinity of power no matter which side of that coin you play on exactly so it's really really nice with your ally pool this is probably outside of the unholy trinity uh, the Azog's Legion the Azog's Hunters and the Dark Denizens mm-hmm. no not Dark Denizens the Dog Dark, Dark, Dark Powers Though that's probably the only other trinity of alliance that's as good, if not better, in my opinion. Because the tools you get across those three lists are as good as the variety of tools you get in this. They, they complement each other well, yeah. Exactly. These are both up there. This is probably the best allies grouping no, in the entire game. Saladin. Yeah, but Saladin doesn't. Anyone who can ally with Saladin. Saladin's not an army, he's a mod. Uh, Sal- yeah. Saladin but- can ally with Mordor, Serpent, uh, Faharad, and, and Corsairs. Corsairs. yeah. Which are three. They can't all ally across, but he can ally to all of them, which is important. Yes, too. and he is probably the best singular model to ally in the game. Just because but- six inch bannering for such cheap points is huge. Well, six inch banner with a Hero of Legend. And he brings a bunch of cheap bodies that are not exactly. bad. Exactly, yes. So he's probably the best individual model to ally in the game, but the best alliance matrix in the game relies on either the Azog's Trinity or on these guys' little Trinity. So, the huge amount of allies in the game. So, let's get into the lists. Yes. Tell me about this list, Chris. Yeah, so this is the Dane as uh, Dane in his prime. Dane on his pig, Dane in the Battle of Five Armies. He is, in fact... Oh, that's wrong. It should be pig on Dane, actually, because Dane is always the male well, That's in not this what case. you sent me, Chris. Uh, you've got three goat riders, which is a really nice punch in this list, because uh, goats, although you're quite low model count, can do so much work with this type of fight. Uh, you get six warriors with crossbow and spear. Wonderful. You get shooting power. You get four warriors with shield and spear. You get one warrior with a crossbow, spear, and banner. And then four sword and boards as well. Your second warband, Muon and Dra. Now, I picked Muon and Dra for this list because I really liked the idea of just stepping up uh, my 90 point goat captain to Muon and Dra and just adding a couple of extra goats. That basically got me my extra 100 points. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think because I lost a few points somewhere else, I also added in a banner and just moved some of my points value around a little bit. Mm-hmm. But regardless, Muon and Dra also bring two goat riders, five Iron Hills warriors with shield. Three warriors with crossbow and spear, and one crossbow, spear, and banner dwarf as well. So you get nine points of might, plus you have a master of battle. You have 32 models, which is good. You have 11 bows a turn, with nine of them being crossbows. And then you're 750 points flat. I think double banner with this type of pain in your hero combo is Mm. really tricky for models to deal with. Now you are really low model count, so you have to find that terrain and pivot on it really well. But if you find the right spot to fight, your model count is irrelevant because of how much punch Dane does. And Dane, two spaces over Muen, and then draws your backline cheerleader for move-offs is phenomenal. Yeah. You then also get five goats, which can play wide, get behind, do your traps, do your kills. And I think this list, again, requires really high level of skill to play phenomenally because it's such a low model count list. 
But this list, I can clean house with so many opponents because of what the tools I bring to the table are. What are your thoughts? Yeah, it's pretty solid. Spooky. Five goats is a lot of damage. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't mind it. Uh, I mean, I like more models usually, but that's just... It is what it is. I don't like having a hero that has to do so much work for me. But that's if you're gonna get high. a hero that does all, but Dane is Dane is a good Dane one for because even if he loses, he doesn't die. He's so tough. So even if he like flubs one, he's probably not gonna fail. So and he's only one sixty for what he does, which is yeah. not bad. Like also the amount of times I've lost a fight with Dane and the pig hasn't died. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. So yeah. Dane Dane is okay for that because he's not as he's a lot less likely to lose that mount in one lost fight. Yeah, you, you know, needing to get two wins through rather than one is just a lot harder. And at D six on a mount, and D six is not. Yeah, so he he, I don't mind it. I don't mind relying on Dane in that list. Yeah. Um, how many crossbows are we on? Eleven bows. With so nine crossbows. With, with, no, I think I included draw. Oh, you didn't include draw in the eleven, so nine crossbows and then true shots from draw. Okay, yeah, I believe so. Something like that. Look, it's a solid shooting count either way. Yeah. Um, maybe my only concern would be like a mission that's very movement. Like if you have to destroy the supplies or something feels like it could be a bit rough i think if you're doing destroy the supplies you leave all your crossbows and draw behind and just march up the rest of your list right yeah but i feel like then you're missing a lot of points from the front line you could just lose the fight yeah but if you're pivoting on two of those destroy supply it would really locations. depend on the table and what you're playing against. Exactly. But i'm just yeah. saying these are my concerns where i think the list is weaker yeah like those kinds of matches look you're playing a movement five list yeah anything you, you that inherently requires, have that downside anything that's, that requires movement you'll, you've you been shafted in some way exactly like, you're, yeah. that's like the main issue with the list in general is like if you get to fight front to back where you want every time you will pretty much yeah. always win but you don't get to do yeah. that like are you low model count are you lower movement than your opponent if either of those criteria are true don't play split out missions and unfortunately if this list does suffer from it's both it's those. both yeah. of those problems so those missions will, will be hard but if you get to just fight you know, if it's like even just like capture and control, where you can kind of like leave the objective and just take the fight to your opponent, and they're forced yeah. to fight you on the center line, or any mission where there's only one to three objectives. Yeah, if you're playing, you're, you're um, what's it called? If, you, if you're playing, what's it called? Central control or whatever it's called. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hold ground. If hold you're playing hold ground, you just walk onto it and fight them there, and they don't like, they don't get there first and force you off the area. Yeah. You're in such a good spot. Yes, and even with even if you get there second. Dane and five goats on the charge. That's going to crack. Mm -hmm. At least some... If they don't have an answer to that in some way, like some sort of magic control or a good counter charge character. They, or the they, fight fair to punch back or whatever yeah, that yeah. looks like. Dane himself will cause that issue. And five goats behind him, like you're going to be doing so much more damage than your opponent expects. And if, even if they hit turn one, followed by the troop line supporting in turn two... That's huge. That itself could be game ending, especially if Dane master battles and wins a move off. <laughs> I've won games off of Dane being in range for a crucial move off with four to five goats behind him, winning the move off off someone else's might point, and then winning the game because of it, because of the way that I can just deconstruct the entire battle line. So, fairly elite, but like I said, if you can play it well, you'll be set for success. Anyway. What is one of your lists? So what about, instead of doing that, we just call three for three heroic combats, Chris. <laughs> and we also have more models. Mm -hmm. So my list here, this is a list I've run quite a bit. Thorin King Under the Mountain, nine Iron Hill Dwarves with Shield and Spear, two Iron Hill Dwarves with Crossbow and Spear, and one Iron Hill Goat Rider. Then we have Bard and the Fam with Horse and Armor, Alfred, Sigrid, and Tilda in tow, eight Lake Town Militia with Shields, five Lake Town Militia with Bow and Spear, then you have a Lake Town Captain with a shield with six Lake Town Militia with shields, four Lake Town Militia with bow and spear, and then Bane Son of Bard with four Lake Town Militia with shield, nine mites, 39 warriors, and then you've got like six heroes, uh, 12 bows, including Bard's rapid fire machine gun, and then 750 points. It's a very scary list. I played it far too many times. It is, it's it's very probably scary one of my best win rate lists. It's like yeah. very rare that this loses. So the thing with this is you've got your contingent of dwarves as your anvil that you can sit around. Yeah. And what that does is it you can either use them, so the shield and spear on all of them. Yeah. Sometimes you go out front, sometimes you go back. If yeah. you need, if it's an opponent that's got a lot of punch in their troops, you put them out front. Yeah. If it's a fairly mediocre punchy army, like a strength three or even like a strength four, but nothing special kind of army, yeah. you put your goons out front and then the dwarves just provide you fight four yeah. across the line. That way your fight four stays alive longer. Yeah. And your entire line, and sometimes you can split them off, like in that game we were talking about earlier, where we had that you know really tight choke. I just sent all the dwarves on their own into a choke and they and just they sat last there forever. and they just last forever. Yeah. So it's very versatile in how you use the two halves of the list because um, the dwarves can be very self-sufficient and Bard's 12-inch banner 
it's going to buff all of your Lake Town, which is going to give you rerolls across your whole line. Yeah. And then Thorin and Bard are putting out both free hero combats at three attacks, four on the charge. Exactly. So they're yeah. punching a lot of damage through. Bane usually is going to either combo with your Lake Town Captain or with your Goat Rider to mm. call combat with someone else who can do damage. Yes. And so you just have a lot of versatile damage output. I have found a lot of players in the game at the moment are what I like to call passive players. They're players that like playing the game slowly and conserving might points into the late game. If you do that against this list, you've lost the game. You have to play a burn game back and match their free heroics for your real heroics and just hope that because they have the lower fight models in those late time militia and lower defense models, you have to try and just burn through them and break them early. I find that the longer a game goes, the worse the game gets for you against this type of list. And the other problem is, unless you have five, six heroes, I can just put Thorn into you and go, all right, let's go. And the problem is, Thorn doesn't even need to call a strike back most of the time. He won't die. Yeah, exactly. Not in one turn anyway. And so, like, the amount of times I've seen people put, like, a a two-wound, two-fade, or three-wound, two-fade hero against a Thorn, and they've called a strike, and Thorn's going, well, you're on foot, and I've charged earlier. I'm calling a combat. Or even better, I five-upped. Yeah. You're now knocked prone. Call your strike, I'm calling a combat. Yeah. Um, stuff like that. And like, there's a lot of other stuff that's very subtle. So it says 9 might, but effectively it's a 12 might list because of the way Alfred works. Yes. So, and there's a bunch of tricks. So Alfred can, Alfred, the way Alfred works is um, before priority roll, you can give, you roll a dice on a 2 plus, you give a might to a friendly hero. On a 1, Alfred gets the might instead. Now, if you give that might to a hero with 0 might, if you roll a 1, you're always plus 1 might. Yes, because... because- it just says that Alfred gains a point of might and the hero and that loses, he was losing one. point of might, but you can't lose what's already zero. Exactly. So yeah. there's no thing that says you Alfred can't... doesn't gain the might if the other hero exactly. doesn't have might. So yes. you're always going to score that extra might, and also because Sigurd and Tilda are heroes, you can now place these two models that don't need to fight. They just need to be within six of Bard or six of Bane, yeah. anywhere you want for calling com- uh, moves. For calling moves. Yes. It's also it's a it's an excellent counter to Master of Battle because you should just never let Master of Battle happen against you as this list. Yes. Master of Battle literally doesn't exist against moves because your yeah. sisters should never be within six of Master of Battle. Here. What do you have? One, three, five, seven heroes that can call. Heroics, is that right? Correct. Seven heroes I can call heroic. If more than half of those heroes are within range of a master of battle, you probably aren't a very good player that's playing with this type of list. You're probably used to playing a 2k of a list and aren't spreading your resources out effectively. But yeah, so the ability for Sigurd and Tilda to call stuff like that is, is massive. Yes. Um. And just being able to go like, look, my left side is absolutely mopping up because I have two of my three combatters on that side of the board, but my other side is struggling. I'm going to put my might point onto the side that is winning so that I can win harder and then sweep across the back with three combats. Mm -hmm. Cool. I'm going to put this one onto Tilda this turn. Or flip it the other way. I think if I win the move off on my right side, I can go from losing that side to holding that side and that might be long enough for me to swing full circle with my other side. I'm going to put my point that way. A lot of versatility in how you use might in this list and it's very, very powerful. Yes. And as long as Alfred is sitting relatively central... It's kind of irrelevant whether or not he gets a might point. Like, sucks to suck when you roll a one and he's. The but one he should be up. in a spot that he can call a move and be effective anyway. Exactly. You just can. You can like. You assume. You place him, assuming he will get a might point at some yeah. point. Like if you place him, Sigurd and Tilda like that, you should never yeah. be in a spot where you can't get what you need. Exactly. Move. The only feels bad is if he's in range of an Azog or something for the massive battle back. But, but even then. Be. Sometimes it has to happen that way because he's the one distributing might to other people. But if you, if your model. Is if you as long as fun, fighting the front of your line, yeah. your model should be six away from him while touching the model that you want to move. Into yes, him. that's the perfect situation. Sometimes it works. Most of the time it works actually. Occasionally, especially if they call a combat or manipulate something around, that can change. But for the most part, if you can keep your three non-combatant heroes in the back lines enough, or at least screened outside of that six of any master of battles, you basically just have so much control of the battlefield. Like, you say it yourself, it's nine might at game start, but actually, let's talk about You generate 12... three a turn from free heroic combats, and you have three extra on Alfred. Yeah, so it's 12 <laughs> over the course of Alfred a one-turn game, right? If you distribute them out oh, all sure. early. Yeah, if you, if you count all the free... You're probably calling about three heroic combats with each per game, because sometimes you'll be striking, and the game is probably three to five turns of combat. Yeah. So realistically, you're looking at, like, 20, eight, 20 might. might, effectively. Yeah. Which probably don't even use it all. The amount of games that you and I have ended 
where but, your heroes have either won the game or, or, or died with two might left. <laughs> or right? I've spent three might to win, win a fight, make right? my three yeah. into a winner. Like, I yeah. guess that's what we're doing. But like the <laughs> fact that you can actually just, like, you can play Bard like Barmia, right? Yes. Where you just go, well, Bard's, you know, rolled a four high on the charge against a Shagrat. Well, okay. Uh, two two might, might, I win. Whatever. Yeah, cool. it's oh, now I'm zero. Off. Oh no, next turn I'm back to one and I have my safety struck again. Yeah, by the way, I've caught a combat anyway, so Lamau, let's go. Even yeah. better, I think the way Alfred is worded, you can give up to multiple characters in the same turn. Yeah. So if you've got your zero might um, Bard and your zero might Sigurd, you just go, I'm going to give one to Bard, one to Sigurd. Now I can call a move and I still have my safety strike on Bard and exactly. I can call a combat if, if he wants to. Yeah. And so, so that type of play just changes the dynamic of a lot of games. It's very hard to deal with. But also tricky to play well. I think the difference between a good, great, and phenomenal general is apparent when you play this list. I've seen this list played by you, and you've deconstructed me before. I've also seen this list played by someone else who was trying a very similar list to you, <laughs> and I genuinely think I lost five models when I was playing a Serpent Horde list. You, you really... Yeah, you can... It like, can go really wrong. If you don't position your models properly, your Iron Hills have no banner. Yeah. Uh, you know... Bard and Bard is very vulnerable. He's only D five with three and three fate, sure, but D five sucks. Yes. Um, Bane can just die. He is a child. He has only one attack. Yeah. The Lake Town Captain is only D five at fight three, four, which is not very good. Yes. You Everything need to. All low. the pieces need to come together. It's a very synergistic list. Everything on its own sucks. Yes. Except like the dwarves, basically. But even then, they have no banner dwarves. Yeah. Doran is like the only independent operative. Unless you're, like, in a choke with the dwarves, basically. Yeah. Lose ten times on this list to then win your next 50, basically. Yeah, basically. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Thorin self-banners is the important thing to remember yeah. with this. So Definitely. Otherwise, yeah. he has no banner, but he yeah. always has mana because he has to do the on himself, yes. uh, which is very clever. It's phenomenal. Yes. Anyway, let's move on to the final list. Tell so, us about this list, Chris. Yeah, this is the old man who sometimes learns new tricks, right? So, this is old Dane. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, Dane, king under the mountain. With uh, nine Iron Hills Warriors with shield, four Iron Hills Warriors with spear and shield, four Iron Hills Warriors with crossbow and spear. There's no banner here because he is the six inch banner. You then have Gloin, champion available, with three Warriors with shield. You have three Warriors with shield and spear. You have three Warriors with crossbow and spear. And then you have one Goat Rider. Your final warband is Doi, uh, who's got three warriors with shield three warriors with shield and spear three warriors with shield uh, with spear and crossbow and then another goat rider so it's 10 crossbows it's 9 might 9 might 38 models 750 points and doi you probably if you want to play in a tournament would just straight swap for a captain to be honest with you so you have march in the so list so you have march in the list is now, he 80 points? yeah both 80 cool I would probably drop one guy to put him on a goat yeah possibly um, but either way... Like, but yeah, other than that, yes, I, I agree entirely. You'd switch him to a captain on goat. Yeah. You lose one guy, but you gain massive damage impact and exactly. mobility. Yeah. Three attacks with plus one to wound on three heroes is very scary. These lists, this is obnoxious. Yes. It's just really... These kinds of lists, I've played quite a few of them. And the thing about them is that you can't really reliably kill these heroes. So you have to just kind of race to the finish line against them. Yes. Because they're not as killy as, like, a mounted guy with a lance, but they're pretty close because all of the time your mounted guy on lance overkills two models. Yeah. And they slightly underkill two, but more often than... <coughs> often enough, they'll kill two anyway. With a strength force spear behind them, they kill two models a turn. Yeah, but not as reliably as a guy with a lance Then eight does. dice. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Or even six dice with a lance. Yeah. So that's the thing. You're kind of racing against something that's not paying as many points as you. Mm. You kind of have to feed them chaff or try to force them into 1v1s. And when you're doing those 1v1s, the defense 8 heroes, you... You're never going to kill them care. unless you commit a lot into them and it's hard to do. So you yeah. kind of have to ignore them. You kind of have to like get behind them. You have to outmaneuver them as well. That's yeah. the other thing. Um, 10 crossbows in this list means you can play the shooting war if you want to. Probably don't want to play it for very long because your crossbows can get outmaneuvered. And the longer the dwarf line stands still, the less ground you gain over a course yeah. of a game. You have the crossbows there so that in some missions you just auto win on deployment when it's a mission you can just stand there. Yeah. Like, if you're playing a game like To the Death or Lords, it's phenomenal because your opponent probably is going to deploy aggressively into you. If you're playing against Mordor, you just sit there and laugh. Yeah, literally, right? And if they deploy opposite you like 28 inches away, you march five inch or you walk five inches every time it's their priority first. Mm -hmm. eventually you're going to be in range they have to do something about it they're going to cop two turns of shooting lose like yeah. five orcs and then fight you yeah 
and that's it like if your killing kills one model but meant that you fight in the choke point you've done your job it's Does irrelevant it? what the kills and shooting does outside of forcing your opponent to fight you where you the person who's shooting advantage wants to fight that's all that matters and, yeah, and then also if you kill two models you paid the points you spent across well also I mean also, the more you kill the better right like obviously if you kill eight models because your crossbows popped off over three turns and phenomenal. but you also just don't need to kill that many models to pay them off because exactly. you've paid what 20 points 10 really effectively yeah so if you kill two orcs you've paid your points yeah I look at it as if you kill four models in a game with shooting your shooting no matter what shooting you've brought to the table has been paid off pretty much short of like for unequipped goblins but yeah it's it has to be like an insanely cheap model for it to not pay off that quickly and if it is that cheap it probably has killed double that many because they're d3 or d4 yeah exactly right so yeah it's it's very good to just have the shooting just as a way to force the game yes. to come to you i've played a game against a uh, man of mine jason and his hunter orcs right they had defense four i'm oh, strength no. four i played a game where he broke before combat started because we played a game where we started 24 apart and the one turn he almost got in range of me it was his priority first and he had the choice of do I walk within 6 inches of my opponent and let them do counter charges do I stay at the dot 6 inches away from their front line in which case their front line doesn't have the crossbows walks their back and I get shot for an extra turn for free or do I not engage the crossbows who have almost broken me already it was a lose-lose-lose choice he had to make. Yeah, shooting kind of works. <laughs> but, like, the times you'll get that matchup happen is very uncommon, right? Yeah, it's not most games, but some games you just auto-win off shooting. Some games you just get major advantage. Some games it does nothing, but you only spend 10 points. Exactly. Matter. And outside... It's always worth bringing because when it impacts the game, it impacts it in such an outsized way for the investment. Yeah. And on the games where it does nothing, who cares? You spent... 10 to 20 points and that's it right and outside of a tournament honestly if that's the type of game that gets rolled up you say to your opponent let's play a game that we're going to have fun with instead right but in a tournament game like if you or the iron hills play against that hunter or sound matchup you get to laugh at your opponent and say look this will be a quick game before lunch but you can shoot your strength two bows at me i know you're 50 percent bow limit i see you yeah i see it i see it. i see it i yeah. see it. what are you rolling to win my front oh is that six is fours i see oh six is five six five oh yeah yo i see and leggy it's a shame that uh we're still gonna lose our pig what's your army bonus again <laughs> yeah. oh nice yeah cool. <laughs> it's fine right <laughs> yeah, all right i think it's all for today is it yeah um yeah, yeah what's, uh, what's our final have... thoughts yeah, do we have any final thoughts? Uh, my final thought is dwarf good until dwarf bad. Dwarf good until... What is the dwarf good and when does it become dwarf, dwarf bad? Dwarf good when dwarf get to fight in choke point and you have to walk at him. Dwarf bad when he has to not stand still. That's fair enough, yeah. I think that summarizes this list, or these lists, I should say, really quite well. I think if this is an army that gets to play into their field then they're winning really hard. Mm. But they're having to maneuver or spread out or fan out Dwarves as a faction, or as just an entity in Lord of the Rings, are a faction and series of factions that struggle a lot. I think the more condensed you get to play the game, the more this type of faction works. Conversely, something like the Serpent Horde, the more spread you are, the better the game is for them. Mm -hmm. This army excels in that big block of, you know, 10 inches across and is glistening with heavy armor and heroes whilst something that will force them to spread out like objectives or different shooting lanes stuff like that or even just terrain set up that's when they're really going to start to suffer or if the dwarves have to base race you into the middle of the board or something like that exactly yeah these lists will struggle but you had a huge diversity in heroes probably one of the most dynamic groupings of heroes because of the access to different tools they bring to the table. There's a lot of wacky abilities. Exactly. And the fact they have such good allies mean that those abilities will always find a use if you're willing to commit them think to the game. When you, when you ally, I think you can get a lot out of dwarves because having them as a tool in a wider army where you can cover the other downsides of having slow models that are expensive yeah. is when they are strongest. Literally. Like, if you just say to yourself, I'm putting... Hilda and a captain so I have my march and I have a yep. 30 point fortitude hero yep. and 24 like even just 20 late towners that's roughly 150 points you're spending kind of it's like st it's stupidly cheap you probably spend about 200 points to get 24 models and like 3 or 4 might yeah it's absurd because your late towners are 5 points based going to 6 or 7 depending six on their war gear yep. so let's say you bring 20 of them mm -hmm. let's say you're doing 120 points on them and then you have your 80 points heroes mm -hmm. that's absurd that you've just done that and boost your mod count by 22 points. Mm -hmm. 
And if you want to bulk that up even further, you can again with another captain or Percy in this case. And yeah. so oh, if, if, you want, if you want might, you can go Percy cap and bring five might. Exactly. Right? For another 20 points. For another points. 20 points, right? 220 points. Oh, boo-hoo. Like, who cares? And now you've got another five, you know, 480 points of dwarves or whatever to fill out the rest. Exactly. And I think that's the type of stuff that dwarves combo with. When you look at either that or you go, I'm going to tower and fight six myself up with Thranduil and a... And then bring up. some cheaper calf to be my flank guard stuff. Exactly. Yeah. And so I think when you look at that as a holistic viewpoint, that's when these sort of armies go from that good to why aren't these being played more in competitive scenes. So I think the dwarves in standalone are a fantastic, phenomenal army, but because of their alliance matrices and legendary legion bonuses, go from that amazing to even better. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I like dwarf allies. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, if you have made it all the way to the end, thank you as always for listening. Uh, this is something that we don't do to try and make money. We do it because we love the game, we love the hobby, we want to encourage other people in it. Um, that being said, if you'd like to support us, the best way to do that is to give us a like, leave a comment, all that sort of stuff. Subscribe! Yeah, you could even subscribe. For the next episode in six months. Well, look, we're hoping to make it a bit hey, we're, we're still now. doing better than, than, you know, the release schedule. <laughs> yeah, that's true. We are doing better than the models release schedule. If we ever get worse than that... Yeah, that's when then, we're in trouble. Yeah, exactly. But if there's more models <laughs> releasing than videos coming out for this game, then we're, we're... I feel like we got close between this one and our last, but it's, anyway... It's all right. Thank you all very much, and I hope you all have a lovely day. See you around.